And we're kind of live, except I'm playing the music over here in the other corner because I just like it. Okay, here we go. And, and so that's, I think that's we are what I live. said that, that the Nazis didn't deserve their knees. And so I just took the hammer and I just bashed the knee as hard as I could because white supremacists don't have rights to knees. That's that's what we had decided. So, Oh, you said we're live? My yeah, bad, we're man. alive. We oh, sorry. <laughs> Good place to start. I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't realize we were live. We were talking about the forging hammer and its uses. Uh, so we are... Uh, welcome back to Omnipotent Beard. Wolf, it's been what? Several years uh, since our last stream, yeah, I think. It's, it's been 87 years. Okay, it's been three weeks. But, uh, you know, it's it's been a minute since, we, uh, since we've done an omnipotent beard. Um, but we are back and awesome to be back as well. We've got, looks like we've got 143 people who have jumped in, which is awesome, y'all. Uh, and I see Yes Cat is going crazy over here in the chat. Uh, we added a couple of member emojis, so... Uh, we're going to see a little bit of that. And uh, I see sacrifices to Ram as well. Um, but yeah, Wolf, what do you, how have you been for the past little bit that we've been gone? What have you been up to? I've been fantastic. The uh, I've been hanging out with the community a lot more. Been doing some live streams on my channel. Um, been working with a couple of very talented artists, specifically uh, Jail in our community, who helped me run a ritual a few months ago that you guys loved a whole lot. And Jail and I are putting out some really awesome art, some of which I am wrapping right now. It's my camera. There it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, let's see. We should get the uh, uh, link to your merch in the chat. Um, if I don't know if Dino's in the chat, we'll, but we'll get it up. Like, we'll, yeah, yeah, yeah. Post we'll, it later. We'll, we'll, we'll post it later. Don't worry yeah, about yeah. it. But, um, uh, yeah, I've been, uh, been developing that art with Jail, trying to get the entire Norse Pantheon done probably by the end of the year, but about every two or three weeks, we should be releasing a new piece. And it's, um, if when you go look at it, uh, right now we've got Hell and Thor in the store, but it's the, the, the goal of the pieces were something casual that you can put on a t-shirt, but also reverent enough that you can put up as an altarpiece for you pagans who are still in the closet. You can like put it up and just be like, no, it's art. And I just it, thought it looked cool. Yeah, mom, dad, I'm <laughs> not. Mythology is I'm, awesome. Uh, yeah, this is just mythology. <laughs> it's just mythology. I love the stories. Uh, so that's that's where I'm at. I've been super stoked about it, but been been having a lot of fun hanging out with the community and getting getting to know everybody a little bit more. So last week I made a video about latent Christianity. Oh my gosh. That got, writing that script got me thinking about some conversations I've been having with a new friend. Uh, that I found on the internet. Uh, this is John Steingard over here. Uh, What's John, up? how you doing, man? I'm great, dude. I'm I'm just fantastic. I'm I'm just chilling. We still got a little light over here on the West Coast, so it'll get <laughs> progressively darker in here. And I have to I have to come clean about something right uh, off the bat. Yo, my uh, my studio is a is a 1969 Airstream trailer. I was gonna ask that. Yeah, it's, it's a, <laughs> I was like, it's it wasn't, a, when I first saw it, I wasn't sure if it was fisheye or just awesome. No, so. it's, it's, <laughs> well, it's a bit of both. But uh, yeah, no, it's a it's a it's an Airstream trailer, and uh, there's a bunch of crap back there, and that is. <laughs> And that you're is blocking because, it well, though. Yeah, yeah. I never would have noticed. <laughs> right, never would have noticed. I was like, uh, "Wow, that chair is very aesthetically put. That's nice. Yeah. I like, uh, I like the setup." We are uh, the the short version of the story is that we're moving out of our house, kind of temporarily and kind of permanently. Um, Bro, for, if you had told me that you lived out of that trailer and traveled the world doing podcasts in amazing places, I would have believed you. I would have been <laughs> well, like, that, wow, that's awesome. That sounds like a really good pitch for a TV show. I right. Really that's what I'm like. That. Or I'm like, John's so much cooler than me because he <laughs> travels the country. <laughs> yeah, except, uh, you know, like just I just travel to places with, with Google Fiber only. I just cannot Smart. handle slow slow internet. Yeah, it's a pretty quick way of transporting yourself, I, I imagine. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, you, so what, what caused me to reach out to you was uh, that you've been doing a lot of conversations about uh, deconstruction mm -hmm. um, that have been really interesting to, to see how people respond to it as yeah. well as seeing you kind of go through this process of deconstruction with respect to like kind of leaving Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, so like, how can you describe a little bit about like how you started this? You, you were talking a little bit before we started streaming about sure. like 
the name deconstruction and even where yeah. that comes from and all that. So, yeah. Well, yeah. So, so, so technically I'll, I'll start on deconstruction. I'll just mention that for a second. And then I might just give everyone a little context for those of you that don't know who I am, just a little context on like why I'm even here. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so on deconstruction as, as just as a side note at the beginning, we all sort of have, a lot of us have come to use this term to mean basically deconstructing Generally, we're talking about deconstructing Christianity, although it, it can apply to any belief system. So it, sure. it, it, even non-religious ones like po politics, for instance. Um, but for, in general, as a, well, as a quick as a quick point out, mm -hmm. though, like a lot of the people in this audience are familiar with the term reconstructionism, which is something very totally it's different. different. One letter, yeah. but totally different. <laughs> yeah. And actually, my yeah. uh, at the beginning, when I started writing deconstruction on my iPhone, it would it would autocorrect to reconstruction. That's interesting. Actually it always really tells me it's spelled wrong. Reconstruction. Irritating. <laughs> yeah. So, so yes, yes. When I say deconstruction, uh, it is, it is not anything related to, uh, the reconstruction that you're talking about as a right. pagan for, for sure. Um, technically the term deconstruction was coined by Jacques Derrida and he's talking about something completely different also, but cont sort of more in pop culture today, if you hear someone say deconstruction with regards to Christianity, what they're generally meaning is someone who's sort of like started to see things in their Christian beliefs and go like, wait, hold on. I didn't, that's something's off there. And right. then maybe sort of take apart your beliefs. Um, and they, they sort of have to be core beliefs because you might, you might sort of, as a Christian, you might analyze some of the sort of ancillary or secondary beliefs, but these have to be pretty core beliefs for this term to really make sense. Okay. Um, so like, you know, do you believe in God at all? Do you, or gods, you know, do you believe, uh, that Jesus died on the cross? Do you believe that he, he was resurrected? Um, do you believe in salvation through faith in Jesus and that kind of thing? Um, so that, that's sort of the deconstruction thing. And there is a loose community online uh of people who uh have sort of come out of christianity through this process and and landed all over the place i mean like right. identifies all kinds of different things now um and then for me the way i found myself there is i was actually in a christian band for 15 years uh called hawk nelson mm -hmm. and I, look, I looked up that band uh, today <laughs> <Yeah>. actually <laughs> You guys are pretty good. <laughs> oh, thanks, lie. thanks. Yeah, so like, you know, we're, we're from Canada originally. I'm a pastor's kid, so my my uh, my family is all still a part of Christianity. My dad's pastor's still a pastor. grandfather or oh. grandson here, so right here with you. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, you know, did Christian music for 15 years and toward the end of my cr Christian music career, as I was already sort of wanting to wind it down because I've got kids now and I just didn't want to travel so much. Um, as I wound it down, I noticed that, um, and, and I, I became less financially dependent on the band. Mm -hmm. I noticed that my, my, my questions grew as my dependence on the band shrunk. That's interesting. Um, and I, I think honestly, I just, I had some probably some deep doubts that I hadn't really processed until I, until I had the, until processing them no longer threatened my livelihood, you know? Right. Um, and I'm not sure how much of that was conscious and unconscious. It's hard for me to parse out. But as I started questioning these things, I questioned and, and really started reading a lot of stuff that I would never have read before. Learning things I would had, you know, wouldn't have dared to sort of, sort of take on before. And the more I learned, the more I doubted and eventually i felt like i had to come out and say like hey i don't i don't think i believe in god anymore i don't think i can identify as a christian anymore uh and that was about a year ago and, and so i've been you still sort of, in the band at that point or are you still in the band now like how, no how does all the that band the band was pretty much wrapped up at that point okay. yeah now we never really did like a public like bye bye. Mm -hmm. It was sort of like a quiet departure. Just, from right, the, I feel you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's the best situation you could have asked for. <laughs> like, no, no, no hardcore falling out or hurt feelings. It's just no. Nah, yeah, you later. it was just sort of this like, hey, we're just gonna like take a step back. I think the idea was like, if we ever wanted to do some, if there ever came up some sort of cool opportunity to do yeah, like to a back reunion thing, yeah that we might leave by doing that we might leave that door open of course i have i've scuttled that 
uh, opportunity now because no, you know no one in christian music would would unless i reconverted to christianity Just i don't do think it briefly be, you know <laughs> Yeah, I don't think they'd be all that interested in, right. in uh, anything I have to say anymore. So oh, that's frustrating. Um, so I guess, yeah, that's a, a kind of a thing is I guess it affects what your options are in the future once you sure, come out about that sure, kind of thing, but right? For, yeah, but for me, it was like, and and I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this in your journeys, but like the the sense that my my personal beliefs had shifted pretty dramatically from what my sort of in the band, the people that followed the band, what their perception and belief of my beliefs was, the 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 disparity between those two things became, it started to feel kind of dishonest for me. Like I mm. never said, I never went out and said anything I didn't believe in, but by it felt like it would be disingenuous to let people believe that I believed things that I don't, you know? Right, right. Um, and so, so that's why about a year ago, I started talking about it. About six months ago, I started this podcast and YouTube show called The Wonder and the Mystery of Being. And I just I interview people. Um, some of them are Christians. Most of them are not. Um, but just sort of showing a different side of some aspects of faith and belief um, that I hadn't really considered before I left Christianity and, and, and putting those conversations out for people uh, to consume if they're maybe in the position that I was a year or two ago or, or even right now. So for me, I, I, what you said reminds me of something that happened to me while I was going into, uh, before I started doing this, mm -hmm. um, which was that, you know, I had start, I had thought about the idea of starting a YouTube channel or something like that fairly early on in my journey into paganism. But, uh, I also was like, you know, I just converted from Christianity to, to this and, you know, after when I was starting to think, because I was in like the debate scene and all this other kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, my perspective shifted while I was in the debate scene from kind of like a panentheistic sort of view into a mm -hmm. polytheistic view. And uh, I was like, well, <clears throat> I don't want to start a channel devoted to something that's around arguments relating to what I believe. And then all of a sudden completely change. Because I've changed right. like three or four times. While I'm right. doing this, right, like fundamental things, like the like panentheism and polytheism are very different. Sure. Um, yeah. Even though I was looking at some of the same traditions, while you know when shifting between those two views and then eventually settling on one, uh, it still was like that's that's a huge difference. How can I make content that is like teaching people or something or whatever the fuck if I don't know what I believe anyway, and then eventually coming to a realization was like, well, I'm not going to be at the final point of my beliefs until the end of my life. Yes. So yeah. I'm going to keep I had evolving. had a similar experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my solution, because I think, I think I wanted to avoid positioning myself as an expert. Yeah. Um, and so, so what I try to do is position myself as a student. So right. I, I try to go like, Hey, uh, I want to talk to people that know something I don't. Mm-hmm. And I, I'm totally willing to push back if there's a detail that I feel like is worth uh, having a polite disagreement about. Um, but largely online, I want to position myself as someone who's willing to learn and then taking people along with me. Now, of course, you could you could criti you know, it, I'm open to criticism because I get to choose who I'm learning from. Right. right. So there's a <laughs> I, I do have some influence there. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I feel the same thing as you. Like I, I named my show, the wonder and the mystery of being, which is like one of the most cumbersome names you could choose. And, <laughs> and also, 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 no, shirt, right? <laughs> yeah, well, also one of the most vague. Right. And I, that's by design because I'm like, who knows where I'm going to be in a couple of years. Like, right. I didn't I think I'll name probably my have a sense of, yeah. I didn't want to name my channel something, something pagan. Cause I was like, I could change. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like sure. it's cause, uh, uh, you know, for like, I have flirted with atheism before I've looked at, mm -hmm. I've was a Christian. I've been a number of different things before I wound up kind of, and I've been what I am now for some time, but yeah. How, how, how long have you been, uh, you know, identifying like, as pagan, uh, as pagan, like 10 years, oh, yeah. okay. uh, a little That's bit more than a decade as well. Yeah. Um, but that's as, not a small amount of time as yeah. heathen, like it's a third of my life, six or seven, somewhere in there, you know? Oh, oh, maybe just for my benefit, could you parse out, like, if you've 
been pagan for 10 years and heathen for six. Can you parse seven. out what the difference is between so, those two? Pagan includes heathen. So right, like, there's that, 10, that uh, 10 years and then there's heathen in there. So, uh, and I'm working on, I've got, <laughs> working on a couple of stuff that, that might go into describing this a little bit more, but uh, cool. there's a number of different names for what, uh, like worshiping the Norse gods or the Germanic gods mm. is. Uh, it's not a religion that in antiquity had a name. So we have things that we call it today. And there's things like uh, heathen, Norse pagan, Asa through, Vanda through. Uh, there's also Foren uh is something that has popped up, as the, which means old ways. Mm. Um, and But a lot of these terms were at one point pejoratives. Heathen was right. a pejorative, Fordensithar was a pejorative, uh, where it was like old ways meant those those old things you can dismiss, mm. basically. Uh, and Well, and my familiarity with the term pagan is typically from the perspective of Christianity talking about sort also of these, pejorative. Yeah. Like those, oh, those, you know, those pagans, meaning like those people that believe that archaic, you know, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Right. It's very and um, when the term started, it was meaning something. It was meant it's like negative. rednecks. It was like right. those folk, those folk it was, it was Latin for for country folk, but in a pejorative way. Gotcha. The, the ones who live in the dirt. Same with uh, heathen as well. It's the same. I mean, word, my understanding is it actually... was just the German, the German word for it. Oh, okay. oh, heathen. Germanic, yeah. Ger yeah uh, like you have Germanic languages. It comes from uh, Gothic, actually. Yeah. Oh, okay. My my understanding is actually Christian was pejorative at the beginning too. Was it? That would be yeah. interesting. I didn't. I yeah, because it means little Christ. Okay. And so, and so, my th this is my understanding. I mean, I, I if I was to if I was challenged and had to provide sources, I couldn't provide any. But this okay. is, <laughs> but this is this is <laughs> fair caveat. I, I yeah. feel like I've been told uh, for a long time is that the term Christian comes from uh, from people who were sort of uh, uh, against cr the early Christian church. And we're trying to be sort of derogatory and they'd say, oh, you're a Christian. Like, oh, you're a little Christ, like a little mini Christ. Yeah. Um, and it was sort of, it was sort of negative at the, at the beginning. And then, and then Christians just sort of uh, reclaimed the term, I guess. Uh, I know that early Christians used to be referred to as atheists too, because really? yeah, uh, the Romans did. They, they were like, they deny the gods. They're atheists. They only worship one, Whoa. but they deny the rest of them. So wow, and and early yeah. Christians were split on whether or not Jesus. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of different splits, but like, but like whether or not it, if they believed Jesus was God, they were split on whether or not they believed that God was Yahweh. Mm. So oh, because that's you, okay. You had to, you had early factions, so the like the the Ebionites were were Jewish Christians essentially. So they believed that you had to become uh jewish to be a christian so you had to be circumcised oh that's, you, i remember this is like a debate between peter and paul wasn't it that's, that's yes. how i learned about this being framed this is the yeah it was peter and paul but then but then it became it took on a life of its own so the ebionites were very they they basically viewed christianity as a sect of judaism mm -hmm. and then you had on the far other end of the spectrum you had the marcionites and the marcionites believed that uh that jesus was god but that it was totally unrelated to yahweh so the Marcionites rejected the entire Hebrew Bible and they rejected most of the New Testament. They only had the Gospel of Luke and a few of Paul's epistles, I think. And and actually Marcion was the first one to propose a Christian canon. So the very first Christian canon only had Luke and a couple of the epistles <laughs> and no Old Testament. It's a much much smaller Bible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it would have been easier to kind of get a grasp on, but and one gospel even that's not, that's like okay, we have a consistent source here. We don't have to get in get out the comparative gospel books and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, but that's interesting about atheists. I had I had never thought about that. So here's but that's the true. The reason is is that you had in Rome like a bunch of cults start up of like you know people that follow this specific god mm -hmm. or something like that you had a uh, cult of this cult of that or just, let's take for example uh to to throw out a germanic god let's say that you have the cult of Freyr, right mm -hmm. it's a fertility god and all that kind of stuff the romans would look at that and be like oh, okay they are worshiping Freyr, and they would say well we like we worship 
this god and this god and this god. And they would go, oh, okay, that's cool. We worship Freya, but it's that's awesome you worship those gods that's that also thing. exist. Like So they, when the Romans bumped into Christians that were saying, well, we are essentially cult of Yahweh or cult of Jesus, uh, they they saw that as, oh, you follow Jesus. Well, we follow our, oh, you can't do that. Wait, what? Hold up. What are you talking about? It's like, no, none of those gods exist. Only ours does. Y'all are atheists, aren't you? Like those, it, that's the, <laughs> <laughs> that's how that conversation kind of went historically. Uh, Cause like they were familiar with atheists. Like you had people, uh, Plutarch, a Roman historian, writes about atheists and people that, yep. what he defines them as people that overreact to negative um, superstitious elements of religion and then decide to dismiss all of religion entirely. Oh. Uh, usually he, he brings up an example of like atheists that react to human sacrifice and they go, human sacrifice is bad. Therefore, all of religion is bad. So right. uh, therefore we're going to, uh, and he talks about, he writes about that position. Um, so Romans knew about this and they had opinions on atheists and they just wound up being like, yo, these guys are doing the exact same thing and there isn't a, really a difference here other than they're, they, they have one deity that they follow, but they do all the same. They, for the rest of the stuff, they do all the same thing. So from the polytheist yeah. perspective, atheists and Christians, there, that's, there's it's not a, a whole lot of difference I see what when you're it comes saying. to what they're so, asserting about us. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, it's like both groups are saying that your beliefs are false. Right. Right. Yeah. So... What's the difference from our perspective? Not yeah, much. Yeah, it's like right. you're both, <laughs> well, for, on every point that matters to you, right? it's like you're saying the same thing. Yeah, I, that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Here, here's a question, if, if you don't mind my asking. Um, like, in exploring these ideas, I'm noticing that Christianity seems to be the religion uh, that, maybe not the only one, but it seems to be much more exclusionary than polytheistic faiths for instance because you're you're by you're... by nature of what we just talked about right exactly yeah. yeah and um are there are there are there some polytheistic faiths or or traditions that are exclusionary in that same way they or can manifest only the way? bad ones well they, <laughs> they can manifest that way but what i've discovered is that usually there's a relationship with christianity somewhere in there that gets them to start acting that way latent yeah well it's uh there's some uh, there's been some conversations about whether or not Hinduism is like this, right? Mm. Whereas historically it wasn't, but there's some incarnations of it now, not very many, but some incarnations of it now that do react that way. Um, Hinduism is wide and varied and has all kinds of representations yeah. in it. This is like even more so than Christianity, I would think. But I, I actually, in studying various religions, I've had trouble with Hinduism because it's, I find very it difficult. hard to pin down. Very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's, uh, but you get some exclusionary manifestations of it. Same with neo-pagans, uh, a recon kind of families mm -hmm. of religion. You get some of them that start doing that. But I think that when you have that showing up there, it's a latent Christianity thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I the reason why some people bring up Hinduism on this front is because it's older, but this expression of it seems to be related to Christianity's influence with it. And it's not something I know a whole lot mm. about. So like that, that would be, that would take something of a deep dive in order to really explore yeah. as to why that's a thing well, it's interesting uh, or even how like, much it's a, it's a thing. Cause I don't even know how much yeah. of it is a thing that, uh, that side, but. Cause like, if you just look at origins, like if you look at Judaism, Christianity, Islam, if you look at those three, Judaism, I mean, I guess it's exclusionary, but they're sort of like, they're sort of like, yeah, you do your thing. Right. It's, right? it's what, from and I've talked to, uh, you know, I think that there's a difference between what it was historically and what it is yes. now. But uh, I've talked to d have different conversations, different Jewish people, regarding whether or not they are monotheistic or what I call or what is monolatrist. Monolatrism or, or monolatrism is we follow one God while recognizing the existence of others. Right. Hmm. Um, that there there is a special relationship with this one deity but there are other deities and some Jewish people that I've talked to are like, yeah, there's other gods and y'all follow those, but we follow ours. Very similar in, to in like a the cult setting, of view that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. In a modern setting, most Jewish people that I run into these days, they're monolatrists. Monolatrists really? or atheistic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Or secular Jews. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I mean, I mean, dude, there's so much we could talk about there. There's, there's true monotheists <laughs> we as could, well. It's right, like I think Orthodox Jews are true monotheists. Yeah, that's well, like, it's like it's I, that's clear like a when whole you study the Bible complex that, thing too. Yeah, yeah. If like you study the Bible and understand what's actually being said, especially if you're getting the the original like Hebrew translated, oh yeah. boy. Oh well, boy, and it's like it's just a completely different set of work. And yeah. the roots, the roots of Judaism. I mean, it just to me, it appears clear that it's they're... extremely polytheist. Oh yeah, yeah. There's sure. a really good book on that. If you want to dive in, uh, William Dever, "Did God Have a Wife?" Yeah, mm. the uh, the best argument for polytheism is the Bible. Asherah, right? <laughs> yes. So there are temples that have two stones worshiping stones in them that are uh seem to be um like that there's a there is a two gods in the holy of holies kind of mm -hmm. arrangement there uh and william dever goes into the evidence of this and there's different explanations for it some of them give a monotheistic some of them give a polytheistic explanation there's also uh i think that there's a um i've heard uh, explanations that the, the Trinity didn't have a third person to it in manifestation of worship until later. So that's, I think that's kind mm. of revisionist, but you get that perspective. Um, there's also conversations about the divine council. There's uh, with the relationship between the Canaanite pantheon and yes. how that manifests. Because there's a relationship there. Like, I mean, even just like the, the first word that's ever used for God in the Hebrew Bible is Elohim, mm -hmm. which is L and which was, you know, L, which just means in Can you know, the Canaanite language, that just means God. Right. Um, and so I'm that seeing was a hail Kamash in the super chats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I, I made a, but rather controversial video about Kamash. So. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, Kamash, the one, Kamash Thor, the God who uh, defeated Yahweh. God's will. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I've, I've watched that one actually yeah. twice yeah. because it was so like, wait, Hold on. And I had to like flip open. You pull open to... the Bible and there it is, yeah. right? Yeah, it's right there. It's weird. <laughs> and, and maybe this relates to the, the topic that you chose of, of late in Christianity, but like there are so much, there are so many things in the Bible. Like I, I have read the Bible more in the last two years as a non-believer than, than I ever yeah. did as a believer. And I'm more fascinated by it than I've ever been because there's things in there. I mean, I've, I've been, I've grown up around this, around these scriptures and there's things in there I've never seen until recently. And so, I'm sure that still applies. I had kind of the opposite reaction when I'm upon leaving Christianity uh, that I had a, a spike. So I, when I was a Christian, I was like really obsessed with like figuring out how to be the right kind of Christian because yeah. like I was uh, getting flack from to do. right as yeah. I was getting flack from from uh, Southern Baptist for not being a Southern Baptist uh, like in high school right and I, and uh, so I was like pulling out the Bible and going through it and trying to figure things out I would go to a church and then I would want to talk to the youth pastor afterwards and uh, I the conversation would get too much for them and they'd say go away you asking too many questions stop it um, and because I was you know being annoying yeah <laughs> Asking well, and, these, and a bunch of like, like a bunch of questions so uh people that th that have that makeup yeah that have that makeup to ask those questions like that's that's not gonna go away <laughs> right exactly <laughs> so uh but i wound up uh eventually like getting really into it as a as a christian trying to figure out what the right way was and all that kind of stuff and the bible was a big focus on my approach to that and then when i left uh, I became very big on countering it. And mm. in order to counter it, you need to be more familiar with it, even than you are as somebody who holds to it. Um, so I was like all over it. And then the further and further I got into paganism, the more interested I got into like the wealth of sources and stuff that was available there for me to look into. Sure. And I started yeah. drifting away from being so focused on the Bible at that point. So it's just like, there's some, there's way more interesting stuff over here that I'm enriching myself with rather than learning about what to argue against. Uh, that completely makes sense. Yeah. So, and, I, and I've noticed for a lot of people, I mean, I'll just speak for myself. I went through this period of intense 
kind of like what you described where I'm just mm-hmm. like, I really need to know how to respond to these things. Yeah. Like when people come at me with various things, you know, when Christians like, well, what about this? You know, like, well, like a big one is like, well, what is your, where is your morality grounded? You know, what grounds your morality? And like, that was a question that I spent a lot of time on, but, um, but the Bible was another big one of those. And then I, more recently I've been like, okay, so I'm not a part of this thing anymore. Maybe I should make sure that my life doesn't continue to be defined by this thing that I've departed. Right. You know, so maybe I should, maybe I should start exploring the space that I wasn't able to explore before in a more sort of, I don't know, positive is the wrong word, but, um, finding out what you're for rather than, yeah, yeah. I don't want to be defined by where I came from. I want to be defined by where I'm going or where I'm at now, right. you know? And so, yeah, I, I share your, your feeling of like, okay, okay. That was cool. Yeah. But like As now it, let's go. It forward. wound up being like a growing disinterest. And what was, mm-hmm. what I found interesting was the more that I jumped into these other religions and started finding out, I, I was glad that I'd done all of that research into Christian history and the Bible and all mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Cause like in college, I started taking comparative history classes just for fun, such to the point that all of my electives were history or uh, uh, religion classes. And I got a minor in it. Um, but the, uh, um, I wound up kind of taking that. And when I'm reading stuff from, uh, in pagan sources that are written mainly by Christians, I'm seeing where the influence is, which is right. Neat. And then I'm going, Oh, that's a thing. That's, Oh, that's probably influenced by Christianity. And th- which means what's hiding behind it might be this. Mm. And, uh, cause you're, you're constantly having to like, kind of look through these sources a little bit beyond the Christian influence into what was the story that was being told before the people writing it down got a hold of it yeah and then changed it a little bit in order to make it more friendly to what they wanted it to be preserved as yeah you know i mean it's a it's a it's a history is written by the victor situation yes and this is very yeah. much that because mm-hmm. you know the the pagans didn't write uh they they did some rune stones and that kind of stuff but as far as like record keeping and stuff you and I had yeah, that conversation, yeah. what was it, last night or night before last, Ocean? Yeah, where it was like... The, when you... you, They didn't keep records of, like, their... their oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But not... They didn't uh, keep records of, like, simple stuff. Because... You wouldn't think about it. Their their, their daily practices of, of faith and religion was so ingrained in just their daily lives as people... Uh, they didn't think to write anything down. Plus, most of the cultures back then were illiterate, anyways, before conversion. Um, and well, so, even yeah, I mean, I think even in Jesus's time, uh, like about uh, uh, in the Roman Empire, about ten percent of people were literate. I believe right. It's about ten, mm-hmm. and that right. was high. If that's, I was thinking that might be a high number. <laughs> right. No, I and, think I think yeah. it's a fairly accurate number, but it was much high. It was. Compared to other cultures at that time or before, it was very, right. it was, that was significantly high. Yeah. Right. And so think about John, like, I, I assume you've kept a blog, like personally, or maybe even like a journal. Uh, I had, I have been journaling through this process. Yeah. It's slightly embarrassing. But. So but, as you, as you're journaling, um, how many times did you write down how you brushed your teeth that morning? Never, obviously. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, so they didn't write down their rituals because that's how, that's how ingrained it was in their their practices and whatnot. They didn't think it's significant to track down in any way, keep a record of, because it was, of course, it was just another thing that they did. And well, I everybody imagine, did it. Yeah, it was like oral tradition right. to a large degree. Yeah. And so now, like with us, like Ocean and myself, Beofold and a few others who are desperately trying to like go through s- historical sources and find just any little tidbit of information that would inform us how they did things in the past, those things are golden nuggets to us now because we're trying to rebuild what was essentially lost through history. Yeah. Well, and that's one of the like wild shifts of perspective I've had with regards to polytheism or, you know, paganism. Do you say paganism? Yeah, we say paganism. Paganism, paganism, uh, heathenry, and polytheism. Polytheism. Thank you. Um, I always try to get my language right. Yeah, yeah. Um, But uh, 
like that's one of the things that's been a really interesting shift of perspective for me is going like like growing up in christianity you're the good guys obviously and and then and then having this perspective shift of like oh wait so if i don't really believe this this tradition anymore i don't believe the the sort of fundamental tenets of christianity anymore like then i look at the history and i go oh wait like the the efforts on behalf of christians to stamp out other belief systems wow like i grew up in like thinking star wars like i grew up in the right. empire and i didn't know it right so here's here's the other flip side of that that ocean and i both kind of have to reconcile with quite often uh, and most heathens is the do. Vikings are assholes. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> that is, we weren't exactly the the bestest of peoples either in history. But also, um, the bits that we do have written down, Christians wrote it down. Oh, not so us. The so, I, I, there was something on that that we've talked about a little bit before. Wolf, yeah, where it's like, you know how we, in some. I was just, I've watched, I've just, for this, uh, this morning I was working on stuff and I decided what the hell, turn on the atheist experience. And I saw Matt Dillahunty get into it with a Christian who was holding to slavery. Yeah. You told me you were watching that. Yeah. And I was like, hmm. Uh, and wait, was, he, his position was he was affirming slavery. The person that was on the phone that was calling Matt really yeah somebody called in it's it, it's happened a couple of times on the show That's like i've, bold I've claim. only i've only tuned into the atheist experience like a handful of times and two or three of the times that i've tuned in somebody was defending slavery to matt yeah and you you get that a lot in a, a lot in christianity uh so I mean, like S.J. Thomason's defended it. There's been, there's been like several a few, times. Like, so, <laughs> is there defense from the perspective of like parsing different types of slavery? Is that what was that their uh, angle? Usually, what they do is they'll try and negotiate on that. Um, yeah, but yeah, what is what is biblical slavery? But they, like indentured but you, servitude versus chattel slavery. Or no, they'll defend chattel. So yeah, they'll, uh, defend, they'll defend chattel. chattel. Yeah, <laughs> the the question will be: Is it immoral to own another person? And there's waffling sometimes. Uh, and it depends, like, not all Christians will behave this way, obviously, but when you no. get uh, the, some of the people that will call into the show, the kind of personality that no. wants to talk about slavery on the atheist experience is going to be the kind of person that's going to, when they ask that question, is going to be like, um, and then, you know, it, but when taking, like, the, the root of that issue is that there are laws in the Old Testament relating to slavery, and Jesus walks around in the Roman Empire, sees a bunch of slavery, and pr proceeds to not condemn it at all. Yep. Um, and that's weird, right? Yeah. Uh, but, and then there's even further stuff where it does mention slavery. It seems to be like not saying that it's a bad thing necessarily. There's that, you know. It sort of accepts it, like the New Testament in general does. There's regulations about treatment and stuff. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. like specific. Well, the regulations about treatment, though, those are Old Testament. Yeah, yeah, but um, not yeah. But New Testament, you have like be nice it, to your masters and all that. In the New stuff. Testament, you don't have like explicit affirmation, but you do have uh, a sense that like this is a normal part of the world, right. and we just accept it. Like that's sort of the vibe. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in with our with the heathen sources, right, you do have mentions of of what's called thraldom, which is basically slavery it's not there's not a substantive difference between thraldom and and slavery so but when we're looking at that first there isn't like a command that it's a thing you know it, the, the way that we look at morality in relation to those stories is wildly different than how a christian would and we can see that oh okay our ancestors practiced slavery that doesn't mean that we have to and not everything right. they did was good so we can look at that and be like we know better than that and that's a normal view in heathenry. It's not like I, I've not seen a heathen try and defend that outside of one movement, <laughs> which I have to mention now that I'm thinking about it, is you do have uh, a subset of heathenry called uh, theodism that has thraldom worked, a form of it that's worked within it that is that's not slavery but is kind of like culty. It's very it's abusive very kind of thing. It's very um, kneel at the feet of your Lord, and if he calls, it's basically him, modern you, feudalism. You must answer. Yeah, it's very okay. feudalism. Yeah. Um, but 
you know, you're essentially treating people that come into your group like a surf of some sort. And it's, okay. it's, yeah. it's weird. But yeah. You have to earn, you have to earn the right to knowledge. And there's like this secret knowledge tradition, which should not exist because they don't know anything more than anybody the else stuff you does. Get in books and all, oh yeah. All the information they have is in every university library and most public libraries across the country. So the the idea that they're holding some kind of secret knowledge that you have to earn the right to through uh, serfdom, dedication, whatever you want to call it, is ridiculous. And abusive. yeah, that seems that seems not awesome. It's, we did a we did a, a stream <laughs> on it with uh, Rudy X Cult Baby on yeah. our channel oh, yeah. a while ago. Um, and so I don't want to I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on theater. Yeah, I just wanted to. There's cover a whole that thing there. Yeah. Totally. Uh, it's not historical and we actively reject it. Um, gotcha. But I will go wherever you want to go in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I do. For, I want to like dive into for for the point that I was bringing up was more about where you have like that moral examination in Christianity where there is some confusion on that issue. The way yes. that we look at it and how as time moves on, we can learn things seems to be more of a standard within heathenry. Yeah. Um, and polytheism well, it, in general. It seems like you don't. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like you don't have a strictly established canon that that has to be considered uh, immutable. Like it can't be right. changed. It's, there's that is not a that's not a thing, right? That, it, I'm wonder if it might be a little different if there had been more sources, uh, or I, if there yeah. had been pagan sources. I'm not sure, but the fact that like so much of our religion is has this like veil this foggy window from Christian writings that we have to look through and figure out. It results in a, in a case where there's so many different interpretations and so many of them are valid all at the same time. And even when you look at it from a historical view at the time, there were variations like yeah. this. So, you know, trying to say that there's a right way doesn't necessarily make sense within the, the, the tradition necessarily, or even how it was viewed then. Right. You know? I wonder if that's a feature. Yeah, I, like, I think it's a feature, not a bug. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking about that because like that's actually one of my one of my frustrations with Christianity is that and and I, I'm I'm I have asterisks in my mind even as I say this, but right. is that is that it's not updatable. Mm -hmm. And so because you have this canon that can't be changed and it's considered the word of God, um it's like if you read the Bible and then look at culture today, there are some issues on which we have clearly progressed. Right. So like uh, slavery being an obvious example, but I think treatment of women, um, I think, I think, uh, you know, affirmation of the LGBTQ plus community is another one. Yeah. So it's like, there's issues on which as far as I can see, I think we've made, you know, as humanity, we've made progress. Tremendous We're not headway. Yeah. Yeah. But, 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 if you're a Christian who believes the Bible is the word of God, then you have to either disagree with some of those um, advancements or changes, I guess, if you don't believe they're advancements, right. uh, you have to disagree <laughs> with some of those and fight against them, or you have to get creative with your interpretation of the scripture. But there's only a, there's a limit to how far you can bend it. Right. And yeah. so like when there's, I there's actually, things like, clear condemnation of homosexuality in the old testament right yeah how you get out of that there's many ways to do it i actually but i actually yeah so i have i i always try to offer because <laughs> i'm for, for me my perspective like i care more about uh people's uh, i care less about exactly what someone believes and more about how their beliefs play out in the world so sure. i care I care deeply about that second more one. about the and consequences so, than right. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And so, so for my Christian friends, I think there are ways to become LGBTQ plus affirming and still be a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, I think you do have to get a little creative, but no more creative than every Christian is being on other issues. And yeah. so the way, the way that they become bigoted, they also have to be really creative and bend, <laughs> sure. bend words to make them bigoted and hateful one of them yeah so i'm always like i'm always offering to christians like hey the, the six or seven verses that seem to be talking about homosexuality like i have ideas on how you can view those mm -hmm. if you want to follow your gut if your gut is telling you to affirm homosexuality which right. mine was right um before even as a christian i remember how did, when, how did you like approach that actually in a 
Because I guess, yeah, what, so, did you become like affirming before you left the faith or? I think how did privately, that go? I think privately, yes, but not publicly. Um, and, and to be honest, that's, that's something I wish I had had more courage mm -hmm. uh, to tackle earlier. Um, it wasn't until I'd left Christianity that I had the guts to like, be like, yeah, no, I, I, I really do feel like being affirming is important. Right. Um, so, but the way I interpret those scriptures or the way I think Christians can interpret them is like, first off, no, well, first off the, the word homosexuality was not in the Bible until 1946. It's arsenokoite, right? Right. It's in, yeah. Paul uses that word twice. He coins a new word. It's a new gets translated word and it into basically mean, means it's, it's a combination of the word for man and bed. Yeah. yeah. But but also it's been it's been translated in uh, as molesters of boys mm -hmm. in other ways. Sorry, your stream just got demonetized. Yeah, we're getting demonetized right now. Yeah. <laughs> so, hey, all right. That's the um, way I've I've been and and had interpreted that passage was that it was decrying pedophilia. Yeah, and then if you look at the Old Testament examples, they're almost always talking about non consensual encounters, and so right. it's like it's like. I don't, I don't see like, if you're willing to be the slightest bit charitable to the text, you can look at it and go like, Hey, none of these are talking about a consensual, healthy relationship between two people of the same sex or gender. Uh, like that is not what's being condemned here. Right. Um, right. Even in Romans, it's talking about yeah something else. So it's not talking about like a loving relationship between. Well, in, in Rome, what was, what was actually quite common is for is for um but then, but then you get into slaves wait what's so wrong about like say like polyamory or something like that which would you could say that the passage in romans is talking about so uh then you, you that's a different another argument that winds up popping up but I, you know it yeah. depends on how you interpret I try the to text get, like yeah i try to get christians across the across the yeah, line yeah. of <laughs> affirming homosexuality first before we get into everything else right yeah because again i'm just like i i think like I think walking through life, believing that homosexuality is wrong and that everyone who uh, is gay is, is an abom. Like, I think, I think that's like, I would love to rid my Christian, not rid, but I would love to persuade my Christian friends to not hold that view because I think it's so sure harmful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, and then we'll work on other stuff. <laughs> right. No, and I, I feel you. Um, so I guess that is you're still surrounded, I guess, by a lot of Christians in your life or something, or, or like what's, cause if you're yeah, talking, so, I mean, all yeah. of my family and my partner's family are Christian. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of my friends, uh, a lot of my closest friends are still Christian, although admittedly much more of the progressive Christian type. Yeah. Um, so that's good. Yeah. Like so, yeah. progressive, progressive Christians for anyone who, I mean, you, most of your audience is I'm, I'm sure somewhat familiar, but, Mm -hmm. Progressive Christians tend to hold the Bible a little more loosely, tend to not believe in hell, tend to be affirming. Um, tend to yeah. not believe in hell. I didn't know that. I've, I've seen varying degrees of that. It's, it's, I'm, I'm painting it with like, a I think fairly they, like, broad I've seen brush, but Unitarians yeah. do that, but then they've also been distancing themselves from Christianity too. Um, yeah. Yeah. And there's different, there's different forms of Unitarianism too. Sure. So, yeah. uh, it, it gets a little splintered the more, um, the more like niche a topic you get onto. Um, but I think for a lot of progressive Christians, the problem is like, how do I believe in an all powerful, all loving God and also believe that his best solution, uh, is to it's burn all, yeah. most people forever. <laughs> so you get, uh, problem. some people that are into like, temporary punishment or annihilationism or these mm -hmm. kind of things that are kind of like there's conditional immortality. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's all conditional sorts of immortality. I wait, I actually not familiar with that one. Oh, okay. Is so it it's actually sort of, it's related to annihilationism. So, okay. um, so annihilationism is basically the belief that, um, when the Bible's talking about hell, what it means is that those who don't accept salvation will essentially cease to be. And, um, which is, I think we could all agree like infinitely more merciful than burning someone physically forever. Right. Right. Um, but still you'd rather go to heaven if that's an option. Right. Um, so th that's sort of annihilationism conditional immortality. Uh, it brings that whole uh, way of thinking into a less, into a more physicalist view. 
So, so it's basically that like, we will spend those that are saved will be resurrected in Christ and live, live for eternity on a new earth. So there's sort of the new heaven and the new earth and, um, and, and they're, they'll be raised bodily basically. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's sort of like the, the Jewish apocalyptic view of the general resurrection. It's kind of like that. Okay. Uh, so let's, I guess let's take the, uh, (laughs) <laughs> While we've got a break here, I've got a couple things. Okay, um, let's actually go through super chats as well. But yeah, go. For I it. was sure. about to do that. So yeah. we had two people become members. I want to say uh, I want to. I know Dust Case and uh, someone else who I've already forgotten. I'm sorry. It was so long ago. Um, and then uh, Matt Heron. Uh, Matt Heron. Matt Heron. That Heron. Yep. That's right. And then what was that last super chat from Sam? I cannot. We remember had a couple what was that came in. Uh, Go ahead. that I want, I'll just got straight access. Yeah, I've got, I can just read them. Uh, so let's see, red need them all, (laughs) need them all caps. (laughs) Okay. Uh, need them. No cap. Nathan Holland says, what's your best advice for pagans, uh, who have read the books, but are struggling to put the knowledge into practice. Um, so I did a video about what's the right way to do ritual. That's going to, and also on uh, prayer, those are going to be two places to start. But I think that that's, that's a question that is going to require like a whole lot of answering. Um, Nathan, if you are in the discord, uh, ask that again in the discord and we can uh, help you out. Um, Let's see. Uh, The real Tyler Anderson says, shoot, I'm late. I'm gonna have to watch this whole thing tomorrow for $5. Uh, Akita Kubi for the five dollars says praise Kamash, referencing praise Kamash. that uh, God who defeated Yahweh. Jail Murray says, uh, hope you all are having a lovely evening. Glad to catch the stream before heading to sleep. Uh, John Honebean 499 says, uh, still not on the same page, but truly enjoy the uh, content. I'm working on it. <laughs> uh, welcome back. Uh, let's see, Sam Samwise the Sassy. Uh, it says had books I studied in school that were uh, that were required that glorified slavery because without it Africa would have been would not have been converted. Holy shit! Yeah, I've wow I've heard the same thing. That's a take. All right, um, Homer in the woods super chatted for the five dollars. Thank you all, always providing great content. Uh, and also Yeshua Christ has just subscribed, the Son of God Himself. Nice. Um, so <laughs> Yeshua says, it is me, I just, Jesus. I just saw a little notification up here. It says Yeshua Christ just subscribed. I'll have to take a screenshot of that later. Um, actually, you know what? I'll do it now. Um, but while you do that, I see, yeah, a, uh, I see a comment here um, from someone. They say, acknowledging my queerness helped me leave Christianity. Mm. I didn't want to hate myself or my friends for something I couldn't control or change made me see that God as abusive, which I 100% agree that with. That was something that we talked about a little bit, or I talked about a little bit in the Latent Christianity video just recently. Uh, John, you saw that. What were your thoughts I did. on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I thought, I mean, I've it caused me to think about the idea of Latent Christianity a lot more deeply. And I think hell, you you hit a really important nail on the head when you talked about hell, because a lot of the people that I've spoken with over the last year, even people that don't believe in in God at all or gods at all, even people who you know have have no belief in any deities, still experience um, anxiety about hell. Mm-hmm. What if I'm wrong? What if uh, you know, like, especially I, I found at nighttime, you know, um, when you're tired, and and you may have perfectly good reasons for have for the journey that you've gone on, uh, spiritually yeah. and, and believing what you've come to believe. But then at night, sometimes you're tired. You're, you just sort of experience anxiety about, about things. And hell is a good contender if you want to be anxious about something. Right. (laughs) And so you're entirely right. Uh, I think, I think hell, that belief wiggles its way in. I, I, I have come to feel like the most powerful part of latent Christianity, as you're describing it, is actually the idea of original sin. Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense. Right. But it's like, so like, or, or the, like, 
it's uh, just salvation or the, what is it? All have sinned and therefore yeah. have fallen short if, of the glory if, of God. If you do not receive salvation in this way, you're even if you don't hold to original sin, you're still going right. to believe that if you live a certain amount of time, you're going to sin and therefore sure. you're tainted. Sure, right? I, I guess you could say you know? our our sin nature. You could yeah, you yeah. could say that because I think um, original sin is like you you inherit it, like you're born. Right. With it. So I guess maybe yeah our sin nature is a better way of saying it because yeah. it sort of encapsulates the whole thing. We have a propensity to sin. It's unavoidable. Mm -hmm. It's just who we are. Right. right. Um, I think that idea is really insidious because it causes you to, first off, it causes you to doubt yourself uh, when you have an intuition about something and a gut feeling, you question it because you're like, well, I can't trust my nature. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then sort of leaves you open to manipulation from people who are positioning themselves in your life uh, as, as knowing better than you do, which right. it's not like those people don't exist, but sometimes the people putting themselves in that position are not, not really the best not, ones. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and so there's that, but then it also teaches you to not trust other people because you're like, okay, well you other person have a sin nature. Mm. And also if I'm a Christian and you're not, that means that like I have the good thing to counter my inherent bad thing, but you don't, which means you're all bad. Like I went, when I went to, I went to Christian school for elementary school. And when I went to public school for high school, I legitimately thought because it's full of non-Christians, um, I grew up in Canada. So it's like, it wasn't as overwhelmingly Christian as it is in the U S I legitimately thought like when I go to high school, they're all going to hate me because none of them are Christian and they're bad. And I'm, Christian and they're going to, yeah, that, gonna... that persecution complex yeah. of always right. needing yeah. to be a victim. And when... then honestly, like the fact that when I went to high school and they were so kind, like people were largely quite kind to me. Yeah. And that shook my belief because, because I was like, you're the not supposed to be happened, good. Right. <laughs> I kind of want to circle back for just a moment. Real, um, real quick. I do want to mention just because, uh, with what John said about hell, um, what I found about the fear of hell in my experience with it was I, I experienced fear of hell after leaving Christianity significantly. Right. Really? But I find like looking back on it, I find it wasn't a whole lot distinct from the fear of hell that I felt as a Christian either, hmm. you know, because I was as, as a Christian, remember what I said, I was like really into like, what's the right way. But one of the reasons for that was that, I was I was afraid that if I was looking at it wrong, then I would have a, the incorrect image of salvation, not understand how it works, and have done it wrong in some way. Right. And then... Uh, yeah, what if your pastor was giving you the wrong message by accident yeah, or something? Yeah, then I'm going to hell because I didn't do salvation right, you know? Right. Um, and then it came to... Or... or because, you know, there's disagreements among Christians. So once saved, always saved, whether or not you can lose your salvation, uh, whether or not you need to ask for forgiveness for every sin, right? Yeah. Do you need to catalog every time that you make a sin? Do you need to confess it to somebody? Do you need to be forgiven through a priest? You now, know, what if you all... miss one? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what, how, uh, and then when you get into Christ's definition of sin, it's, it's every passing thought, you yeah. know? Yeah, thought, thought crime. crime. So, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, how do you? And so, like for me, that plagued me as a Christian, and and it after leaving it and looking back on it, like every once in a while, more casually now, because mm. uh, I think I've processed that a lot more at this point. But I look back on it and it's like, maybe maybe it was fucking supposed to be that way. Maybe that's what it's mm. designed to be like. Like maybe that fear is baked in in some way yeah so it's, i've i've actually i've i'm trying to remember which book to recommend here um but I, I did a i did some reading about well there's a book called how god changes your brain um and i can't remember the author's name off the top of my head but th they basically studied religions um anthropologically and psychologically mm -hmm. and one of the things they found is that is that is that a lot of religions seem to perform a, a function in early human history that adhered social groups. Okay. And, um, and what they found is it actually, the more punitive 
or the more aggressive the deities, um, the the better it adhered the social group. Okay. And so, and so, so idea, uh, the, like it struck me the other day that like I can't. I'd think be interested of, in looking like their methodology for that because having my comparative history back is mine just going. Okay, there's I'm looking at exceptions to that statement and looking. I'm at sure there are places where mm -hmm. that lands. And, um, or, and also that there's a misconception about pre-Christian religions as well. And I wonder how much that figured into, that, I, like, I think all methodology questions are going I off I think that right you're, now. those are probably all relevant. And, yeah. and what I just mentioned was far and away, uh, not the point of the book. Sure. So it was an ancillary point, but, um, one of the things I thought about was like, I realized this the other day like eternal conscious torment and especially like Augustine's version of it. That was like your, your skin burns off and then God supernaturally like restores it so he yeah. can burn it off again. I can't actually think of a more horrible belief in any faith off the top of my head. I mean. Okay. Challenge then. Let's let's accept it. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I just don't no, know, but I'm, it's like the worst one I can think of. Yeah. I'm trying to, it's, I think you have a contender, but and I'm, I'm, I'm off the top of my head. I don't know if like because even when you get into punishment afterlifes, hell's a pretty big one, right? Yeah, uh, just like generally, because there are punishment afterlifes in other faiths. You have uh, Niflheim in the Norse understanding, which is uh, it's a later belief. It may be influenced by Christianity, but it's very different than hell. It's uh, the place for oath breakers. Oh, and. Uh, it's um, a cold place uh, where you are oh. deposited and frozen, basically. Uh, and then there's also a a belief, a reference in the Voluspa of the dragon Nidhogg, who who consumes the dead. Uh, and yeah. there's a suggestion piece by piece. It's it, the the dragon is consistently hungry. Its hunger is never satiated. It's supposed to be chewing on the roots of the world tree and will eventually consume the world tree. But uh, in the meantime, it will swallow the dead that is deposited there. Yeah. So that's... Uh, Those that's all sound kind of awful. Right. It's a punishment thing, but there's nothing like... There's no description like, and as the dragon digests you, you are reformed and then redigested or something <laughs> yeah. like that. That's not that's not a thing there. Like in order to make that comparable, that I think you would have to have something like that. I think that yeah. being frozen for eternity would be very boring, but it doesn't. There's nothing that suggests that you're conscious and undergo that. Right. Uh, right. So like I'm. Uh, and it's also not like really concrete that that's exactly Even a what thing. happens. Right. Yeah. Like it, the, there are arguments to be made that it, that's not how it is. And though it's either a metaphor or that was a line added later on. Right. Whatever. Like it and could so be just a Christian thing. And we might even be mis misunderstanding what it was. Supposed yeah. I, c I could be misunderstanding like, that know. line completely. And yeah. so could so, of many other people. It's not concrete and baked into how the religion works like it is with Christianity. But in most, I mean, so, so let me ask a question. Is it, is, is it accurate to say within heathenry that for the most part, there's no analog to the Christian idea of salvation in the sense that you need it by default? No. Absolutely not. Okay. It's nowhere, it's so, nowhere even close. So the afterlife in heathenry, um, uh, I guess if it, it if largely got, depends on how you die. If we have mods in the chat, drop a uh, a link to my Norse visions of the afterlife video, um, where we don't we don't have like an account. There's a, there's a few afterlives, like Valhalla comes up or Valhall uh, of like this Helheim. place where you're fighting forever and everybody kills each yeah. other and then they're raised back up and then everybody fights again, which is probably actually the closest to what you're describing with hell, right? Um, yeah. But it's it's rather glorified. Um, and then which there's is stupid. Then there's Folkvangur, which is the same thing except no drinking. Uh, and then that would be a bummer, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I don't know. You're it, the it's the afterlife of a uh, highly venerated uh, fertility goddess. So, but uh, then there's Helheim, which is the more common one. Uh, that is like the one that you might say that if you ha if you're a heathen in the day back in, you know, uh, like 
700 to 900 AD or so, uh, it's it stands to reason that you would probably have this belief of Helheim that was a, a place of green fields that was mm. a paradise of sorts. It seemed to be kind of like what they idealized at the time mm. um, that was an afterlife that you just get. Hmm. Like that when you die, your your achievements in life are celebrated and you're reunited with your ancestors. And I was about to bring up ancestors because yeah. it seems like there's a common theme there that like uh, being reunited with your ancestors is like an important facet of mm-hmm. a lot of these beliefs, right? It is. Yeah. It's it's an it's personally it's extremely important to me. Like mm-hmm. you can you can be a heathen and not interact with the gods but just venerate the ancestors and you could still be a heathen. Yeah. Yeah. Like I you get, could, I get the appeal of that completely. Yeah. 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 I, I have a, I have a video on ancestor veneration and how it's extremely integral. Like you there. So there are three main pillars for, for I'll explain for you just really quickly. It's, yeah. I'm sorry for the audience. No, 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 that, I, no it's fine. Less educated on this. No, this there, is, this there, is are, there are new people in the chat. I see them. And so I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm wanting to explain for them as well. And so you like with Christianity, it's just God, Jesus, and the Holy spirit, three separate, but also one doesn't make sense, but it's yeah. <laughs> focused there. But with heathenry, you have three main focuses, which are the, the gods themselves, and then your ancestors who you have direct ties to, be they um, blood or adopted throughout history, and then um, you have the spirits, the land whites. Yeah, connection um, with nature. Yeah, so you have the land whites and the house whites, but they would just be the the spirits of your area that you interact with uh, daily. Um so those those are like the three main focuses on how you practice as a heathen. So much of that to me sounds like a deep appreciation and connection to your like you, the place that you are from and where you come from. Like mm-hmm. like that's that's what it sounds like it sounds it sounds like that's very emphasized I'd in, say, in a way that I appreciate. I'd say that it's worship... supposed to be done in a way that's non-toxic. Because you right. get some people who are very focused on like, oh well, I'm I did a DNA test and this is <laughs> this is my white ancestors and that's the only ones who matter and that's why I'm important. It's like, well, that's stupid. What have you <laughs> What have you done to honor that? That's really where That's really where the key point is. Is what are you doing to honor that legacy? Mm. If you have a valuable legacy that you think is important, what are you doing today to honor that and carry that on? You can't just sit there and be a shitty person, but also claim that the ancestors that came before you were awesome and that's why you are awesome. Mm. No, that doesn't make you awesome. That just means that you're stealing shows, credit. <laughs> yeah, that just yeah. That just means that you have a lot of luck built up um and that you need to honor that. Yeah. Oh okay. well that that touches on another thing I'd be interested to know. Is there is there within heathenry, is there any sense of anything that sounds anything like karma? There's there's uh, yes. luck. Yeah. Yeah, so luck, luck luck in the Norse concept isn't the same as like, oh, I'm I'm lucky or this cool thing happened to me because I'm lucky. It's it's a lot deeper than that. It's also there's also like a pragmatic element to it. Like, so for example, if I were to harm a way that I would harm your luck would be to like shit talk you to your boss or something like that. Yeah. Mm. You know, it what would I mean? impact your luck. Um, that would impact my luck. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Oh, so that's not anything like karma. Right, right. So, like, but you can, let's say that, you know, you have a, a successful family background or something like that, and then you've inherited that luck. I don't see it being used. At, it, the differences between karma, right, is that it's not, it doesn't seem that there's like a negative buildup so much. Mm. Uh, you can be unlucky in that luck doesn't work out for you very much. But um, that the, the personification of it is there's a, a part of the soul called the Hamingya, which is a separate consciousness. It, it's kind of like 
a spirit deity sort of thing that oversees yourself or family or, or uh, a multitude of things hmm. um, that is an, an overseer of your luck and kind of how exactly it works is going to be very unknown because we don't have a lot written about how exactly it functions. But the Hamingya as a personification of family luck is a through line that shows up. Uh, mm. There's dreams that describe them as like giants that are seen that uh, that walk between mountains and that kind of stuff. So uh, that's, uh, but again, that's a, a description that exists, but mm. uh, the, the way that luck is looked at beyond that is that, you know, things can kind of jump out of the way for you if you're headed towards your destiny and that kind of stuff. Mm. Um, well, and that, and, and just anecdotally, like that feels like it's the case, right? Because you do, for most of us in life, we, we've probably experienced moments in time where we had some sort of momentum in one mm -hmm. direction or another. And it just seems like, like I just speaking for myself, there's t periods of time in my life where it seems like everything's against me and everything that can go wrong goes wrong. Right? right. And then there's other periods of my life where it just feels like door after door after door is opening exactly at the right moment. And it feels yep. weird. Yep. You know, so I, I get, I get w where those ideas come from. <laughs> right. And yeah. as the way that that feeds into another idea in heathen cosmology, which is the Norns, that there's threads of each life that are woven into a giant tapestry that the, the, the Norns are kind of like the heathen fates, but they're a little bit different. Oh, um, the Norns. So. That's a cool word. It's a, there's a, yeah. a, a weaving of a tapestry kind of idea and all of our lives kind of figure into it in this beautiful John, thing. And let's be honest, everything sounds awesome in heathen. <laughs> it kind of does. <laughs> It kind of does. Plus, like, there's some consonants I've had to like familiarize myself with that are not present in English. That that uh, ocean. Uh, it sounds like you're pretty familiar. Yeah. With. It, yeah. yeah. Oh, Wolf, I'm sure you are too. Uh, well, think things look like a certain way. Like D's have lines and squigglies on them, and it's like, oh no, that D's a th. Got to get ready for that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, pronouncing them is weird. I mispronounce it all the time. Like I, I, I've had several comments in my videos where I'm like, you got people. That's not, you that's not the right pronunciation. What are you doing? Stop that ocean. What are you doing? Um, but I Freire. just, I just say, yeah, Freire or Freire. Like there's Freire. the, there's rolling R's that randomly show up and I just embrace every time I see an R that's probably a rolling R. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I'm like with Spanish. I like, so, I, I, I'm, I'm learning Spanish um, yeah. and, and I spend some time in Central America. So like, it's helpful, but y yeah, it's like, I'm just sort of trying to sound like it, it, it gets, when I get the accent, right. It actually mm -hmm. makes things worse for me because, <laughs> because what happens is like, I know just enough Spanish and I'm, I'm just, just good enough that I can sound like I really know Spanish that I can start a conversation and immediately get marooned because, because it's like, they think, Oh, they bought, they bought it. They think I really speak Spanish. And then they just go off and I'm lost. And I have to be like, I'm sorry. Can, you know, like, yep. can we speak English? And if, but every time I think that I've got it down on like how something is pronounced in old Norse or whatever, I, I will try out pronouncing a word and I'll completely You'll have someone it just wreck you. Uh, yeah, exactly. And then someone shows up and goes, you sound stupid. Here's how you say it. And, so, like, for example, Thor, we say Thor. Everybody says Thor, right? Yeah. But in Icelandic, it's Thor. Right, it's, which uh, that makes sense. A little bit different. Um, but I remember the point now that I was going towards with bringing up the Norns in the first place. Yeah, um, sorry. I may yeah. I may have. I, like, no, the tangents. But uh, I let's, see a let's shiny chase, thing. Chase just, the rabbits. Yeah. <laughs> But Wait, I've I've still got a note over here from something that we brought up 30 minutes ago that I want to get. Let me make this point later. with the Norns and then we'll jump into that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the the idea of and how that relates to luck with the threads and the tapestry and that kind of stuff is that what the the concept is, is that all of our destinies are in these threads and we're walking down these threads that have been woven by the Norns mm. and facing the things that we're supposed to face. And we don't. Like there's a lot of things that will wind up in our life that we don't really have that much control over, but we do have control about how we face these things. And the, uh, the threads also branch off and go into different directions and how we face those things might determine how, like which path that we might go down and where those 
lines mm. crisscross and that kind of stuff. So um, like there are shifting attitudes and how we, uh, what our perspective is on things might affect our luck. Yeah. Um, so I, get, I completely yeah. get that. Yeah. Um, I said to my partner today, like, like I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Mm-hmm. And, and so there's some, days where their shenanigans just absolutely drive me insane and I just don't have patience and I feel like I'm at the edge of just losing my cool all day right yeah and then and then another day like or like the last couple of days they're doing the same shit (laughs) yeah uh but some for some reason I'm just like you're not as annoyed by it more okay no I can handle it right bro (laughs) (laughs) as a dad I feel that so hard it's like Yesterday, this drove me insane, and I was really frustrated. But today, I'm laughing at the exact same situation. Yeah, I have no explanation. Uh, it's we're, we're that's human. where my head went when you were describing that. Yeah, ocean, so, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we're we're human. We're dads. This is just a thing. I think that because as I was saying that, I actually reminded myself a little bit. There's a toxic way of looking at that, um, mm. which is how you get stuff like the secret and manifesting and that kind of stuff. Oh, where. Yeah. You know, if bad things are happening to you, it's, it's your, your fault. fault because you're depressed or something like that, right? And I think so, that that's not how I would look at what I described. Yeah, um, I mean, that happens in Christianity too, plenty. Yeah. So, like, I have a friend who's type 1 diabetic. Mm-hmm. And and literally, when he was a teenager, like, a faith healer came to his church. Mm-hmm. And they were like... um, and they were like, okay, well, like we're going to, everyone who needs healing from something, you know, like come up to the front and get prayed for. And he went up and, and they were basically like, if you believe, if you really believe, oh, God yeah. will heal you. And so he, so and he, he like, didn't believe, right? <laughs> he really believed he did. He was probably like 17 or something like that at the time. Right. So his diabetes was new and it was really affecting his life. And, and he wasn't healed. And when he asked why they were like, you must not have believed, you must not have believed enough. And like, that's an awful thing to tell mm-hmm. a kid. Anyway, th- that's the dark side of maybe with some there. practice you'll believe better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Oh, side I mean, note, uh, I just uh, got a text from Shannon Q and she says, Tell Ocean fuck off for me. Yeah. Okay. Fuck yeah, off, I've Shannon. been Shannon and I have been uh <laughs> been telling Ocean to fuck off in chat. Uh I will I'm say hi to Shannon, but I will up. say hi to small cat. Yeah, I'm I'm secretly setting up <laughs> Shannon as a future guest for the show, not be for Ocean, but for me. Like, Ocean's not going to be involved. Uh, I want to bring Shannon on. Fuck Ocean. That's that's where we're at. Fair enough. Um, real quick, I want to I want to say I saw a few uh, yeah go comments in chat f- uh, discussing the the act of getting grumpy at the children and feeling unreasonable about that. I want to say. Uh, number one, you're human and your feelings are valid. Um, don't beat yourself up about it. Be willing to acknowledge and accept that you got frustrated and find a way to communicate that effectively with your child. Be able to say like, Hey, buddy, buddy, child, person, human who also has feelings and their feelings are valid as well. Them having hurt feelings is an acceptable response to you getting frustrated. So be willing to sit down and say, Hey, look, I have feelings that sometimes I can't control. And I just want to say, I'm sorry. Yeah. And be willing to express that to them and, you know, you know, have a big hug, watch your favorite TV show with them, make it up to them in a, in a way that means something to them, but don't sit there and beat yourself up over it, but also don't sit there and let that moment get away from you because it, it may be something that was five minutes for you, but it might impact them for the rest of their lives. I, I know that. And I know several other people know who feel that way as well. So yeah. Thank you. um, That's good advice. We, we do my partner and I, we do a lot of what we call narration. So yeah. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like if we're in a situation sometimes we just narrate the situation like, Hey, like dad, you know, daddy's, frustrated right now i feel upset this yes. is this is why i love you i'm not that's a really good you know practice. this is yeah like that yeah. kind of stuff and just like talk about it and so yeah. and and our kids have learned to do the same thing which that's is awesome. pretty pretty cool yeah i do that with my 14 year old you know she's going through changes emotionally and all that and so it's like hey look I'm frustrated but i'm not frustrated at you i'm frustrated at the situation or i'm frustrated at this and and 
I know it's coming through this way, but I don't want you to like go to your room thinking that I'm like mad at you or whatever. I'm just frustrated and Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. So be willing to have those conversations with your kids, your kids, no matter what age, even if it's like two, three, four, they're smarter than you give them credit for. They do have feelings. They do have emotional ranges and they can sense you and your feelings. So be willing to have those conversations with your kids. It's very yeah. important. Yep. Uh, um, good advice. Let me the hit... other thing I wanted to get back to from earlier. You had a hit... note from a yeah, while Can back. I have super I chats and then we can do, do the note? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. All right, cool. So, yeah, I'm just going to keep doing that. I'm just going to find another <laughs> excuse for the rest of the show. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> All right, this uh, is the show. We're wrapping up. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's tell you what. We'll get to that right after we wrap up. No, anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> just my drink on my cup. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Josie Adams super chats for the four, for four ninety nine. Original sin is the most intense, pervasive gaslighting. Any doubts that you have get filtered through the base assumption that you were born evil. Yep. Uh, Akira Kube for the five dollars. Hyper Calvinism was my stepping stone to escape Christianity. Yeah, which is I find hyper Calvinism to basically be the argument ad absurdum of Christianity. It's just oh my gosh. Uh, yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, Valthan Art says, are you familiar with the concept of the sin eater? The Southern folk practice of someone sitting atop the grave of someone who passed in order to cleanse them. I have not heard of this. Wolf, John, have you heard of this concept? I've heard of it, but no. I'm not intimately familiar with it. I remember hearing a story when I was y- I think there was a book that I was not I was not supposed to read. Like there was a book that got popular <laughs> like about a sin eater. Um I'm going to have to look this up. Yeah, this it sounds awesome. It, it, it's a thing. I just don't I don't know enough about it and I'm probably as I'm remembering it the idea of a sin eater and idea of a death eater are probably are probably merging in my mind. So there's uh, a little Harry Potter it. going on in my head. Yep. <laughs> which is uh, Ray's, probably borderline offensive for your your uh, <laughs> your pagan audience. You know what? He like so many of us are Harry Potter fans. I'm not personally. So I didn't go through that. Can but I can I talk about that for two seconds, please? Uh, let's do that. I literally let's, was let's do that a and, then, and then we'll jump to super. We'll okay, up super chat. So yeah, there's like a whole conversation we had about like Harry Potter and paganism and fuck J.K. Rowling and her uh, <laughs> yeah. fucking transphobic turfy ass. But um, I wish we knew who wrote the Harry Potter books. We the author is lost to time. We'll never know. <laughs> yeah, um, I think it's pseudonymous, <laughs> right? <laughs> but so, like, yeah, I get people wanting to like move away from Harry Potter because of the author and all that. But the people who stand being Death Eaters, even when Harry Potter was like cool. Those people were just celebrating the Nazis of the story, and I'll never understand them either. I just wanted to say that. People who think Death Death Eaters are cool, you're sus as fuck. (laughs) So, Salvatore Kirsten for uh, the 999 says, Thank the gods for you guys. Been binging content all day. So grateful to find a channel community full of welcoming, wonderful people. Thank you. Uh, And uh, John Holmbean, again, uh, here's what hell really is. It's laying your head in the pillow after you've done no harm during the day and are forced to consider uh, that you're a bad person. Um, let's see. Akira, uh, Akira Hakubi for the $5 says you all, including Ali and Jen are helping me recover from Christianity. May your perspective, may your respective gods bless you all. And uh, uh, Hakubi again with the $5 says um, pronunciation is a norn in my side. <laughs> <laughs> That was funny. I like that. Uh, Timothy Ad- Alchemy Freeman uh, super chatted uh, $2 for the with a uh, sticker. Uh, and John Holmbean again says, one thing I find particularly interesting is the same things that we're discussing about Christianity lend itself to Muslim beliefs as well. Uh, culture, and then there's a long ellipses there. I, and I, it's just one thing that I, I would say about that is that like I, I get that there's a lot of similarities between Christianity and Islam. I, I also know is my know know my way around Islam enough to know that there's also substantive differences. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 You can't say so they're the same. There's. Yeah. I. I think that criticizing them independently is the smarter way to go. I actually uh, think Islam is a little closer to Judaism than Christianity. I would agree. I've also said before that like if one of if you go with the arguments for the Abrahamic 
like religions, Islam's got the stronger case of all three of, of the, at least between Christianity and Islam, Islam's got the stronger case in my opinion, because really, yeah. Uh, and I've, I've ranted about this before with a couple of people, but I saw a debate, um, with a guy named David Wood, uh, and a Muslim apologist whose name I forget, um, started with a Z. Uh, but he, there was, it was a really interesting conversation on the Trinity. And it was one of the videos that I watched and researched for my, uh, Trinity video. And one of the things that he argued was, uh, that a lot of what Christianity has is indirect revelation. What mm. Islam has mm -hmm. is there was a conversation with Muhammad and we wrote down that conversation. Yeah. So it's as yep. close to that. It's as far as getting as close to revelation as possible. That argument makes it stronger. Plus it's truly monotheistic. It doesn't have this Trinity issue. Uh, which I you see can, what you're saying. Yeah. Both of those. Know? I know. I think those are lending Islam, points. Yeah. I know within Islam, that's one of, that's one thing that Muslims generally point to is that, is that this was like actually dictated to Muhammad by God. I mean, according to Gabriel, them. I think is what it was. Yeah. But uh, it's like, as the angel Gabriel comes down and like um, make sure that oh, he re remembers. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a detail I had missed. It's kind of a big one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny, right? It's like with Christianity, like the Trinity, for instance, like I had a conversation with a Christian apologist recently and I, you know, was talking about the Trinity and they were like, we were, we were talking about, you know, they said, God can't do things that are illogical. Like God mm -hmm. can't make a square circle. And I said, why not? Um, which was a trap. Totally. Uh, cause I was, prepared <laughs> I saw for you laying idiot. that trap. I wasn't sure how, like, yeah. <laughs> that was absolutely how ready. For, okay. All right, cool. It was absolutely I, a trap. Cause I saw that conversation. I was like, what is he doing? And <laughs> it was completely a trap. Okay. Yeah. And which like, uh, you know, whether that's cool or not, I don't know. Yeah. I was, just cur I was genuinely curious as to what- Trap questions for those kind of things. It's, the it's theologically valid I was curious as to what his answer would be. Yeah. And, and you know, he gave an answer. I don't remember what it was, but but I was just saying like, well, like clearly Christians are comfortable believing in things that are not logical, like the Trinity. Right. And, and then, of course, we had a we had a conversation about the Trinity and his, his defense of the Trinity- Is actually, the Trinity a square circle? Yeah. That's what I was saying. It's yeah. the same thing. It's just, it's the, it's the, it's the nonsensical thing you're used to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's like, like we, you and I have talked about, like that was not something that was forefront of my thinking when I was leaving Christianity until I saw your video on the Trinity. And I was like, wait, uh, yeah, I'll add that one to the list. <laughs> It's just winds up. It's interesting because I didn't think about the Trinity either until after I had already left Christianity. Yeah, uh, the, you when, just kind of accept it. When yeah, you're yeah, it. exactly. Because I I wound up. I, it's weird getting back into latent Christianity, I guess, and and de yeah. like this is more of a deconstruction conversation. I think there yeah. is that like okay, what was my perspective on the Trinity when I was a Christian? And I can't tell you. I don't know if I was a modalist. I don't know if I was a, a tritheistic looking at it tritheistically. I don't think I, most uh, Christians know what a modal, what modalism is. Right. And, and I don't yeah. partialism. I, I think that the way that I was looking at it, if I was like to try and be honest with myself and like really parse it out, I, I was either a partialist or a tritheistic. Cause like I, I seem to recall myself thinking of the, of the Holy spirit, Jesus and the father being very distinct parts of the divine which would make it partialism. Uh, yeah. But then also very, diff I also saw them as personalities distinct enough that they acted independently of one another. Like Jesus praying to the father didn't strike me as strange, you know, because I saw them as separate things too. So, yeah, you know, I, I don't know how I saw it. I like, think I just didn't I've, think about it. Yeah. Um, I know that when I prayed, it was always to God. Right. And, and like in, in a, in a sort of God, the father kind of way. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I mean, like you get Mormonism and they actually do believe that it's, it's, those are three distinct entities. Um, so there are, there are those in Christianity. There are some that do view the Trinity as distinct entities like three three of yeah them. like yeah. as huh <laughs>
Yeah. So I, which, I don't know. And it's like, like a, to which it's I a bit say, of like, deconstruction. Well, that's polytheism, right? Right. No, it would be. And that's one of the um, actually getting into studies of the Trinity. One of the things that somebody sent me after I'd made that video, it's like this solves all the problems, and it was Richard Swinburne's theory of social theory of the of the Trinity. Mm. And I watched it, and uh, the more I understood the argument, I was like, okay, this is this is a coherent, concise understanding of the Trinity, and I actually quite like it. It's also polytheism. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and for our, I, for for comrades in the chat, this just proves Ocean Reed's theory. <laughs> Oh, when someone says you're wrong about this ocean, let me send you a thing. I will chase it down. Yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm super interested in doing that. And I was like, but my response to that particular one was like, I, I didn't cover this specifically in my video, but I did cover tritheism, which is basically what this is. So I, I feel like this is addressed. I didn't feel like I needed to like make a follow up or something like right. that. Right. I think you, know? you mentioned it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But I didn't mention social theory or Swinburne or anything like that. But I love talking about it now because it's so interesting. But mm-hmm. it's it's definitely like it figures out kind of a way around it. But it basically like to to articulate it, it's like there are imagine three chairs in the room, right? There are one of them is Jesus, one of them is the Father, and one of them is the Holy Spirit. But they all share the essence of chairness, right? But that doesn't yes. really change the fact that there's three of them. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so it's, <laughs> the, the, the stream that you may have seen part of, the, the Christian apologist I was talking with, he basically said, like, you and I, you know, he said to me, yeah. you and I are, are uh, we Humans. are each human beings, yeah. but we share a, the essence of humanity. Right. And I was like, okay, well. Then like, he's a tri- we're, he's we're a poly distinct. he's describing polytheism if he's making that's that how, analogy. That's what I yeah. said. I was like I was like, well, you're we're separate beings, obviously. So if if that's an analogous to the Trinity, then we're talking polytheism, right? And, and that was that was, and I think I, I think I mean I can't remember where the conversation went from there, but I don't remember him having a good response to that. <laughs> I'm going to finish up Super Chats, and then I want to get to uh, Wolf's note. I mentioned it yeah. last time. So, uh, Fishy Long Note says, note. One, one of my friend's grandma <laughs> used to always claim that playing World of Warcraft was going to turn us into a bunch of witchcraft practicing pagans. Cough. I say this about D&D. D&D is a gateway drug to yeah. paganism. Yeah, D&D and, and WoW are gateway the, drugs to The concerned paganism. Karens of the 90s were right. Uh, yep. Samwise, the sassy super chatted for the five dollars. They explained the Trinity to us in school as God's different personalities. Uh, so that that's modalism. Uh, yeah, believe it or not. Uh, let's see. All right, I've got, I lost my space. All right, Beth says, "Ever wonder if the Father comes from the Father adapting adapting pagans into Christianity? The All Father adapting pagans. The All Father. Yeah. I, you know what? I wonder." Uh, I'm mean, gonna have to look into origin of All Father as a concept because I yeah I, sounds I don't like th- it would just be like a patriarchal. I don't think so. I don't think yeah I I, I wouldn't think so either personally. Uh, a few seconds ago, Jen Aldrich super chats popping in to say hi to two awesome people in Ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and then Aikida once again says, "Hey Jen, hope you're getting better." <laughs> Aikida, you're awesome. And there's this amazing note, which everybody is hyped up. This note is going to be so badass. Let's hear the note. What's the um, note? Okay, What's the so mysterious before, note? real quick before I get to the note. Um, Wolf is now okay. putting off the note. I'm, that, <laughs> I'm now going to put off the note, but I think this is another important thing to address. Uh, we were discussing in chat, like people um, being told, like, I, f- I forgot the context already and it's too much to scroll through and I'm not going to try Ask to track it down. The note knows. The, the note should know. Uh, I can only hold so many notes. So um, talking about how people have had to like grow up, they, they, they always said that they were like old for their age or they were, you know, wise for their age or stuff like that. And I just want to point out that that's usually uh, like being growing up too quick and being advanced for your age is usually a trauma response forcing you to cope as an adult. And so uh, when it comes to like talking about that in, um, like religious contexts, like it's just something that you might want to be aware of. Um, it's, it's, it's a thing. John, you've got thoughts. 
That's uh, that's uh, just sorry, Wolf. You just made sense of my teenage years. That's I know, all. right? Like <laughs> when you when you when somebody says it out loud, and when I typed that out in chat, everybody went, "Yes, exactly." Oh like, my god, you're making so much sense. I was like, "Oh, that checks out." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I just I just kind of wanted to throw that out there real quick. All right, but, guys. Uh, I want to note. Turtle notes in the chat. Everybody sees that there. What Rex notes. just put. Yeah, there are turtle notes. turtle notes in the chat. That. We need to have the note, but we okay. can't have the note until there are turtle notes, turtle note emojis. So this is going all <laughs> the way back to the the statement acknowledging queerness helped me leave Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to hate myself or my friends for something that I couldn't control or change. Um, that was the original comment, and we went down this rabbit hole, which needed to go down. But a different rabbit hole I wanted to talk about, and this goes back to us talking about hell and it being this uh, tool of fear and control, because once you do leave the faith and you say, well, I left Christianity because of this, um, the, the, the church, the, whoever it is that's speaking to you about it, will use these manipulative and gaslighting techniques to say, well, you're only doing this because you want to sin and you're oh. still sinning and the, the hell will still be there to catch you. So Don't just because you leave off, Christianity, Wolf. just because you left Christianity doesn't mean you're getting away from it. it hell will me. still be there to get you. And so they put that fear in you and control you. Even after you've left Christianity, you're sitting there trying to heal and get away from it and live your life. Like you're supposed to be able to as a free person, in whatever it is with like your sexuality or whatever, then that, that cloud of anxiety is going to hover over you for the rest of your life because those words were said to you as you're trying to, to, to leave. Well, and they're all, yeah. It reminds me of the, the tweet that Frank Turk put out a little while ago. Do, do, do you, do you see that I thought we might one? be going there. Yeah. 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 I'll let you say I it. was, I was <laughs> straight pissed about that. Mm. And I don't, all this online discourse between people who believe different things, I don't get pissed very often. Like I, I don't I, I, anymore. I, I used it's to, like, but it's I like, it's like I give a wide berth to stuff like that. I'm like, okay, whatever. But I think the reason that frustrated me is that I have been on Frank Turek's show mm. talking about my, my experiences and my, the reasons why I left Christianity and, and my sexuality had nothing to do with it for me. I mean, right. and, and, and it never came up in the conversation. It wasn't a factor. And so what Frank's, oh, what, Frank, really, what Frank said, it was, was something along the lines of, I feel like every time I talk to somebody who left Christianity, it's because they wanted to have sex with somebody they weren't supposed to, or something along those lines. Yes. It was that, it yeah. was that there was actually a, another tweet, maybe a few days before that was something along the lines of every, uh, every time I, every time I talk to someone who deconstructed, uh, it, their sexuality was also a factor. Like it was very similar point he was making yeah, yeah, in yeah. two different tweets. But, but the thing that frustrated me is I was like, like, I get, like, I guess it's, if he feels like that's a common thing he encounters fine. But like, I was on his show talking about exactly that issue and it had nothing to do with my sexuality. And unless he thinks he knows something about me that I'm not saying, well, if he assumes it about you, then he gets to say it. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't we, look, John. We have I to. We have to. We have to presuppose. We have to presuppose that it was anyway. Our, <laughs> no, our friend, I mean like yeah, but like I, I, I'm just like either he. One of I think what frustrates me is that like I feel like what he's doing there. I so rarely try to call people out specific. Like I, I try to avoid calling people out specifically as much as possible. But this one, this one frustrated me because I'm just like, like either. I, I just think, feel like what he's trying to do is stir up his audience. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, like I don't even understand what you're trying to accomplish by saying that. Right. And it's not like he hangs out in the, in the thread and like responds to people. He just drops out and walks away. It's probably scheduled. He probably didn't even know it was going out that time. You I didn't know? mean I to know. distract with the Frank Turek thing. I don't know. Wolf wants, probably wants to get back well, on track. I'm so bit. sorry. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. Our friend notes from autumn says, what did the tweet say? So the audience knows. Yeah, I, that's what I was, I, we just talked about it, that it was like, uh, that 
Frank Turek said every time he's seen somebody that deconstructs that it that has oh, to do with their sexuality. It's because or they want to leave Christianity. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I did yeah, see yeah, that yeah. tweet as well. Yeah, yeah. that was a yeah. bullshit take. And yeah. he's an idiot. Yeah. We started talking about it, but I, I did say it. And uh, then John brought up another one. I, I didn't realize he'd done that twice, but he, it was within like a week. It was two. They were very similar. Yeah. But yeah. But you were like about to react also to what Wolf had said as well about the hell, hell kind of keeping you like they, they put that seed in you. Like it's almost like a mustard seed application to the hell <laughs> thing. Like the there's like it there's does, like the mustard people, seed of Christ and then the mustard seed of hell or something. People like that. who convert back say that that's the thing that gets them to come back is the fear of hell because really? as on their way out the door, I've I've been told that hundreds mm. of times is that they tried to leave but they were brought back in but now they're finally out or whatever. But if usually if someone has a I reconverted story at some point it's because on their way out the door they were told you'll be back because of this you're only leaving because you want to go sin uh but you'll be back or See, or else you'll burn that didn't yeah, work I, on me so hard that i didn't realize that it i mean it makes sense that it does with right. fear of hell being that it, that it does work on people i do think that there's another aspect to that that like that Christians who say that about people that leave are often doing that for the benefit of the people that have not left yet. Right. Like, or from, for the benefit of keeping people, like it's like an explanation, right? It's like, Oh no, no, no. This person isn't leaving because they have legitimate issues with our theology. It's, it's because they want to go have sex with someone they're not supposed to have sex with. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, or like the hell thing. It's like, it's like same same thing. I think it's about it's about keeping the people you still have much more than it is, right? A, a, about trying to like lasso the person that left. That said, I I don't know how much how of does, these dynamics are conscious. I like, saw, how does that dynamic work against like straight white cis people? Like I'm I'm straight and I left the church not for any reason that had to do with any kind of sin. I didn't really change my life when I started being a heathen. I Yeah, I didn't change I, my personality that much. My, my personality was has always been the same. I actually went, I, I've talked about this before, I actually went well, back to church. Uh, eventually over time, just because it's been a decade-long process for both of us, but uh, I actually went back to church about seven years into being a heathen just to kind of like make sure. And uh, I was accepted I've with open arms into the church uh, and I actually helped them out quite a bit. Uh, and I, I made a couple lasting friends, but still I was wearing my mule nerd to church every day and they knew I was like heavy into Norse mythology and they kind of like watched me be more open in public with my uh norse faith and they totally like started raising their eyebrows at me but i was still showing up at church just to like make sure i was double checking some things and making sure it wasn't like okay maybe it was just this experience let me try this over here so i lost my own point i don't remember what i was saying Oh, real quick, it, it, I'm going to read a comment in the chat that I thought yeah, was amazing, ahead. which is from the Blair Witch that says every queerphobic comment a Christian makes makes me even gayer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the gayness intensifies for sure, is, is, is what I've witnessed. Um, oh, I remember now. But it's just like, I didn't, I, didn't tr I didn't run from the church to go do a thing that I really wanted to do. I fell out of the church just as a natural progression of going down lines of logic yeah yeah i think i think for me it was it started with the experiential things like things feeling a little bit not quite right and maybe some gut feelings um and then seeing doing some nonprofit work abroad and seeing suffering on just a tremendous scale right and and going like oh wait and honestly becoming a father mm. and and going like okay like I've always believed in God, the father who intervenes on behalf of his children and, Ooh. and no one is intervening in this suffering that I'm seeing. Right. Yeah. And like, I was seeing, I was seeing communities where kids, most kids don't make it to the age of five. Right. And so I saw that and it caused 
me to really question things. And then I got into the theology and the the real critical thinking about it. And that's when things started. So, to kind of so remember apart. you saying to me, problem of evil really had an effect on you. It was a huge deal for me. Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally first and then logically. Yeah. Right. So I, yeah, you're seeing that and you're like, how is a loving father capable of this? And well, then... and, and, and it's like going like how, how I, I saw things that if I were God, I would intervene. Now I recognize mm -hmm. the easy criticism there is like, well, God knows things you don't know. And so I, I get that, but, but I still found myself being like, okay, like a God, like a God who is a loving father. That's the way God had always been sort of painted for me. Um, and then becoming a father myself, right. And knowing how I feel about my own children. And then seeing children in some of these communities that I was documenting, uh, suffering in, in ways that, that I'm just like, it doesn't make sense to me that this God that I've always believed in could see this and do nothing. Right. And, and then of course, a lot of some, a lot of times Christians will criticize me as saying like, well, I had an emotional response. So I left Christianity. I think that's valid though. Like this, well, is, this is something that frustrates me a little bit is that when, when you're, if you're talking about like the function of love, yeah. How is, how is an emotional response not valid in that case? Sure. I don't, I don't understand what the objection there would be. Is I, th I think that I think they I think they're trying to make it sound like I'm being irrational because of my emotions. I think there's a rational conclusion from emotion. Sure. Like that the 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 emotional reaction is valid, and then you're making logical deductions from it. <laughs> like yeah, well, like I that's, went, it, that's all that that is. I don't like because when we operate on like premises, especially when you're we're talking about a premise of the function of love. And then you have an emotional reaction and response to something that definitely isn't loving. How is that irrational? Yeah, I know. I, I know. Well, know. <clears throat> there's, 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 there's two things that I found that a lot of Christian sort of theologians or thinkers or writers. We or get apologists. to the apologist types. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. apologist types that, that they'll really push back on. And that's, uh, that's emotion. And, um, oh shoot. What was the other one? Uh, a subjectivity. <laughs> <laughs> those two things they just hate those things and uh, so like they'll they'll say like well if you're being emotional that means you're not being rational and if you're if if you believe something completely. is subject which i i disagree yeah. with too but like they'll also say like well if, say if something is subjective nerd, like, it's not meaningful like they talk about morality and they're like well if if morality is not objective then anything goes and i'm just like no that's not true <laughs> like, well, then, why, like, is, why is god allowed to act out in emotion but christians aren't i because God reacts emotionally anger, consistently often. throughout the Bible. Then you'll have to, yeah. And on top That's of that, another problem. I had a conversation with somebody recently uh, on the, on the tweeters uh, about, um, you know, that, that, uh, that damn bird app, that, that bastion of rational discourse, twitter.com. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so there was a, it was a conversation about meaning, right? And it's like, if you don't have a God that determines meaning for the universe, then there is no meaning. And I was like, well, you know, that's not true. You can have like, you know, nihilism and existentialism, these other ideas that are like, basically like, because there isn't like a highly objective meaning that in fact, things are more meaningful because we can determine our own. And that creative force is like, is super cool. Um, and that's meaningful there. And we can create our own meaning, so that's meaning. Uh, so why why doesn't that work? And the response was, "Well, that's imagined." And I was like, "Well, wait, why does God get to do it? Yeah, what? Wait, what? Hold on a second. If and it, it seems like well, God can just imagine His own meaning, and suddenly it applies to everybody. And the the response to that essentially was that was a, an appeal to the to the idea of God being a foundation of being in the first place, a ground. Therefore, being. Yeah. Mm -hmm. His whatever meaning that He deduces." Is mean, but that's just like that's okay. the argument you'd have to make, I think. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It, it winds up being like, okay, so we can get an ontological meaning out of it, but I don't really know what effect that has. Yeah, you know what I mean. I, mean, I don't know what that that meaningfully <laughs> changes. Yeah. I, I always about I always, what about whether or not there is meaning. You know. Yeah, because this is how this is how Christians will get out of the. Um, I always get the youth of dilemma mixed up with the epicurean I, paradox but 
Um, I, th- I think that the this, one, this would be euthyphro. I think it was where you're going with it about like, right, the, what like, the term is, is meaning. Is something wrong because God... Yeah. Uh, is something right because God commands it or it, it does God command it because it's right? Right. Or, or something like that. And that's like the that. same question to be asked about the meaning conversation, right? Yeah. Same thing. What yeah. determined... Kicking that can down the road doesn't actually mean anything. Right. Well, but then the way that apologists will get out of this is they'll say like, well, well morality is grounded in God's nature. And but then the thing I always want to ask is that I don't hear people ask the very God's often nature. is like is like can God change God's nature? Yes, that's a, I love that question. So I do for Euthyphro dilemma. I I'm sa- I've specifically been go that, that route. A- <laughs> yeah, no, I I will specifically go that route with Euthyphro dilemma, and I find that Christians have a really hard time with this one because here's what here's what happens in that dialogue tree, um, is uh, I will accuse them of kicking the can down the road. Uh, of with respect to the euthyphro dilemma. And I'll just say, the, you, all you've done is kick the can down the road, and now we're going to walk up to that can and kick it again with the euthyphro dilemma. What determines God's nature? Is God's nature such that it is because he made it so or something else did? Yeah. And because, because if <clears throat> there are things that God is subject to, right, then that means God is not ultimate right there you are have the same outside of right? him yeah yeah so or outside of them yeah right. so uh yeah yeah i i don't and i feel like by the time a, a, a conversation gets to that point we've we've gotten so abstract mm-hmm. at that point that it like my my brain starts to lose grip on concepts because it's like i feel you it's like We've gotten so abstracted that I've like lived I'm... there for a long time, so it winds up <laughs> it winds up being it get it gets more intuitive after a while. Yeah, but like with Euthyphro, I wound up seeing like no no no, there's a third horn, and it's that it's in God's nature. I'm like, but that doesn't solve anything. We wind no, up just that having definitely that horn has two horns, and uh, then they they try to create a third horn out of that, and it's like, but no, but that horn has two horns. You you still have to determine at some point on down the road that God either consciously developed his own nature or his nature is such that it is for some arbitrary reason, at which point that whole idea about objective meaning kind of falls down. Like the dominoes all start falling Uh, because even God himself, as Christians describe him in order to prevent an infinite regress with things like the Kalam winds up getting into infinite regresses when you start asking questions like this. Yeah. I mean, I mean, to a, to a degree, I actually don't know how you get away from infinite regress. Uh, you, it's, <laughs> I don't think, okay. So I've been having some interesting conversations around this and I'm pontificating here. Yeah. Uh, that there, there might, okay. So in order to get to the time that we are now, time advances at a certain point. So if you have an infinite regress, then how did time advance such that it got to this point? That's a question, sure. right? So you can look at it as, okay, so at least in this universe, there's a <clears throat> something related to a T0 of some kind. Um, that <clears throat> there was a change that took place. Yes, in this universe, yes. Right. So, But that's, but that's carrying we, a lot of baggage. That, <laughs> right. But that, that, that only gets us phrase. to this universe... Yeah, what what there was bef- before that, uh, what caused what explanation there is for the universe? Uh, explanation I've heard is a better term because cause also implies that implies there's a time, time, and mm-hmm. if you don't have it, then you can't have causes I've because heard there's no temporal sand state. universe <laughs> as well, which I think is an interesting way to put it. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, and I'm I. Look at that, and I go, okay. Well, maybe there was something that pre that pre exists in some way that changed into the universe that we have now that we don't know anything about. We can't know anything about, and that's fine. I'm still here. My camera battery died, and then we've lost Steingard as soon no, as I talk I'm about the existence of the universe. And you're, you can hear him still. Right? I know I can. Okay, and yeah, he's still here. Um, but we've lost him. He's back. Nailed it. <laughs> Look at this guy. Look at this guy. But yeah, like that's that's kind of where I'm at on that. I don't I'm fine with not knowing that kind of stuff. Also with uh heathenry, to get into comparative a little bit, the uh we have to wind down soon because we're getting on two hours. 
Yeah, I, I was gonna say. No, we're my, just getting my, started. My kid's bedtime's coming up. So yeah, yeah. I, oh so we God. should we should take off here in a second. So, but heathenry isn't as concerned with creation as Christianity is. It seems like with Christianity, if you undermine creation, you undermine Christianity. Oh, but with heathenry, for sure. doesn't I? It's not how I it think is. The, I, I think actually think the the fall is the reason why creation is is so important to Christianity because there needs to be a, a something to be saved from. Right. So. So I think that's why like Genesis and the interpretation of Genesis and kind of getting back to original sin or our sin nature. I actually think that's why creation is so critical for Christianity is because you, you have to have a problem. Also, it shows solving. that like God cares. That's the personal nature of him. It's like, well, of course he loves you so much. Look at what all he built for you and that he created you. Mm -hmm. oh and, my God. you know, there's a bunch of those ideas that I do think are beautiful. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's, there are things for people who, you know, and, and, um, and what, well, well, forgive me if I, for not remembering or not knowing, but did, did you grow up Christian as well? Or, oh, or, absolutely. Okay. I thought, I thought so, but I, I was a little foggy. So maybe you've experienced this. Like there are aspects of Christianity that I actually miss. Yeah. Um, I, I can't, I can't hold that belief as a whole anymore. Right. Um, because there's too can many I problems. Ask, can I but, ask what's, what are some, like, I know that we need to be winding down, but what are some things that you do miss if you don't mind talking? No, about not at all. I mean, a little bit. I, 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 I'm, I miss the sense that there was a loving God who's involved in my life, right. sort of working behind the scenes. I've, can I've lived, a, I've lived a life that actually like i've i've had a lot of really awesome experiences and right. and so it was easy for me to look at my life and go like oh god's favor you know mm -hmm. and now i don't know what to do with that I, I i sort of go like i mean i know i work hard but i don't think i can attribute all of the good things that i've got in my life to that right, right. if so, if i can at the risk of sounding proselytizing and I, the only reason i bring this up for it is because Ocean and I have actually been um, kind of bouncing back and forth on a future project we want to do together, but talking about how the gods do actually, the, the Norse gods do actually care about you on a personal level, because mm -hmm. there is rhetoric going around that say that they don't, and that they're mm -hmm. largely removed from humanity, and they don't care about the day-to-day, -day, but that that's not true at all, and it's definitely not how I or I, basically any heathen i know in my circles the the hundreds and hundreds that i interact with and the like 20 or 30 that i practice with in person um the gods are extremely personal and you can create very meaningful uh relationships with them that aren't defined on abusive power dynamics and uh like uh punishment um situations where if you don't do something the right way you're going to be punished for it and yeah uh it 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 is extremely rewarding and it kind of like checked that box that christianity seemed to check but revisiting it now yeah. with a clearer lens realized that it actually wasn't checking that meaningful box uh it was actually just a hostage situation mm -hmm. that I, that we were in and so yeah I've, I've actually used that example before I've used it too. I yeah. said like, if, 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 if you're being asked to make a choice about putting your faith in Jesus with, with heaven and hell in the balance, yeah. that's like a gun to your head. That's yeah. not free will 100%. For, a, for a, for a belief set that seems to be so dead set on free will being a really important thing. So important that all the suffering in the world or a lot of it can be attributed to it. Like, right. That's that's not free, will free will is a, is a cast all explanation in order to get out of pretty much any uh, logical argument that you could. Something, like, something free, free will, will doesn't exist. Yeah. Well, and yeah, it's conversations about whether or not free, free will. will. Yeah, but, yeah. So am I. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I have some arguments for it, but I also, like, I, I, I see a lot of the arguments against it. I have a, yeah. I think it's one of the harder things to argue for. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, it is. It's a nuanced a, discussion as a well like a, a and, way to get out of a lot of arguments i've yeah. seen people use it against the interpretation argument which i don't get because i no, don't understand the I concept don't buy that. yeah it, that having work. information doesn't violate free will no and there's so examples see, in the bible of that right so 
if you're coming from the Christian perspective, that objection doesn't work. Right. Um, but to get back to just real quickly, um, Wolf, your question about what things I miss, you've, you've actually sort of addressed one of the other ones is that I do think Christianity, not, not everywhere, but often is quite good at creating community. Sense of community. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say, say that. That's where I'm at too with it. Quite that's good. like the number one thing that every pagan, even the pagans in our digital community all agree on is like, I'm the only one in my area. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's hugely lonely and, and. It's a problem um, atheists will mention too. Like a lot of mm -hmm. like is the community. It's why, is the, a, it's, it's why atheists enjoy the ACA so much, uh, especially the ones who live near Austin, Texas. Um, they, they enjoy the feeling and sense of togetherness and community and support that they can find each other right. a lot easier. Um, well, I was, there. Well, I would imagine a lot of like hearing the two of you speak, you know, regularly online, a lot of pagans, I'm sure get a lot out of that because it's, it's mm -hmm. like, Hey, these are, these are, you know, like our people. And, and, you know, this is the closest thing to a community I have because I live in uh, Arkansas and no one near me. I don't know, you know, any other pagans and, you know, yeah. Ocean I and that I being hugely meaningful. Ocean and I, along with uh, several other people, people we've had on the show um, worked together and started a pagan in-person group and in real life group and it was basically like a pagan church, quote unquote church. Um, it was like moving and, around. It was like we would have it at different people's houses. We would have it at different houses. Oh, cool. yeah. We, yeah, yeah. we didn't have a, a set building, but that actually made it a lot more personable. It's like, oh, well, I'll host this week or I'll host this coming up week and everybody would bring food and we would have, we would all stand around a fire together and we would do our, our ritual. But then afterwards, it was just a big like hangout thing where we got to talk and be pagan with other pagans That's and awesome. we would have upwards of a hundred people in Whoa. person showing up yeah. uh to these events the pagans are everywhere it's just that pagans are not... everywhere one of the problems with pagans forming community is that there's not enough pagans in like specific areas in order to like support the idea of a church necessarily uh but there if you get into like hey everybody needs to come to this spot for like you know once a month or something a like special yeah, let's all go grab coffee thing. together yeah, yeah. yeah then you can you wind up getting uh, that becomes more appealing and you get numbers that start showing up at that point. Um, but it's still like, it's still a logistical nightmare, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's, it can be expensive depending on what you're doing as well. Yeah. Uh, so especially if you want to do something that's like for multiple days or something like that, that becomes the, the just oh, yeah, logistics. Then you've got accommodations, you've mm -hmm. got people food. Right. And, yeah. But that's a, a whole other thing that like we're at two hours, but uh, that's <laughs> if we want to wind down. Um, but yeah, I would say I would agree on top of that, that community is like, as far as if we're going to say we're missing something. That, yeah. Like, I think that's the big one. Yeah. Christianity definitely what I, I had frustrations with Christian community when I was, when I was a Christian, I found elements of you know, judgmental stuff and all this other kind of crap. For sure. But uh, the fact that it was like, no, 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 there's, there are, more availabilities to experiment because after I, I stopped being Southern Baptist, I could go to an Episcopalian church and I found that the community there was much more supportive. You know, mm. Episcopalian Christianity from a community perspective for me was fine. I just not a Christian anymore, so I can't do it. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, yeah, you know, uh, community definitely would be, I would say this the exact same, that at least the opportunity to find it. Uh, yeah, because with pagans, the opportunity to find community is so much it's buried. Uh, yeah, it does. It does seem like you have to hit sort of a critical mass before it becomes a practical thing to do the way that Christianity does it or, on, or yeah. And on top of that, we can't always publicly identify ourselves. Right. You know, so having if you try and start a physical building. A lot of times it might get like, you know, vandalized in whatever way or another by the local I community. I absolutely can see that. So, yeah. yeah, it's, you know, trying to I get would, a... I would discourage people from having a physical building that they advertise the space to be. Right. Before you have an established group, established for probably years, people that you trust and figuring out how to like get that. A sizable first. number too. Yeah, it needs to yeah. be a sizable number before you start spending money on physical location 
Yeah, because it's a publicly a, accessible area. Because you may need security. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You would have to have security. Yeah, yeah. have to. Yeah. It's so, a whole logistical nightmare. Yeah. But anyway, wow. on that note of, to, of community and all that jazz, uh, let's go ahead and wind down. Uh, let's do a couple of, uh, I guess, plugs. Wolf, what do you have coming up, my friend? Coming up, uh, working on a really cool design for both Tyr and Loki. Um, Tyr recognizing the uh, kind of like happiness side of working with Fenrir before Fenrir in the story of Ragnarok turns against the gods and whatnot because of Odin's prophecy there, trying to trying to encapsulate that. And then Loki uh, trying, I'm, I'm working with a very talented trans artist to design Loki presenting in a uh, non-binary trans and um, there were a couple other ones that, that I wanted to capture, but I wanted to capture many different aspects of Loki um, as uh, they are represented in the lore. So uh, look look forward to those. Uh, and John, is there anything else you wanted to add? And where can we yeah, find no. you, man? Uh, yeah, just uh, I'm John Steingard on uh, Twitter and Instagram. I noticed recently that Instagram has become way less interesting to me and Twitter become much more. I, yeah. I don't entirely <laughs> know why. Yeah. I think it's, it's there's more back and forth in a really public interesting way on twitter maybe mm -hmm. but i'm john steingard in both of those places and then on youtube as well uh you can just i think you can just do youtube.com slash got the link in the in the uh Yay! description yeah uh yeah it's the youtube channel is under my name but my show is called the wonder and the mystery of being if you happen to be a podcast person uh it's on all the podcasty places and um yeah not much pagan content there <laughs> but <laughs> but maybe we should work on that so, but no i think yeah. that deconstruction though can be useful for like a lot of mm -hmm. pagans, a lot of pagans watch atheist content, mm. and uh, so deconstruction I think is something that would be really useful for a lot of us. Uh, yeah, I, and for me, the 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 emphasis for me is not to encourage anyone to land any particular place. It's more just to consider things that you may have not considered before. Right. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I just remembered. Hey. We need to go through some super chats before we sign off. Yes, please. Uh, do. Droop for the five dollars says it's so funny that you mentioned that. I literally became a heathen through playing a heathen character. Uh, you guys are great. Uh, and we have a five dollar from Josh, uh, Josh Hutman. Rex two two six fifty seven says, Calcifer, you are doing a great job translating tonight. Uh, this is a bit of channel lore. I don't know how to read. Calcifer <laughs> uh, gives me. He reads the books behind me here, and then transmits the information to me through a very complicated game of charades. Uh, <laughs> which, true. in fact, I should get my my Calcifer merch uh, that I've got here. Yeah, you need to show that stuff off. You've uh, got a really cool one. So, uh, and Akita Hukubi for the $5 says, I left just because I wanted to play D&D. &D. Does that count? Uh, Shannon Q super chatted $5, but I'm not going to read it. I'm just kidding. If I wanted to... <laughs> <laughs> If I wanted to send, I would have stayed where I could to get uh, get instant absolution and not gone where I was accountable for my actions now. Uh, Timothy Alcabee Freeman uh, says, uh, for the $5, uh, doesn't anyone experience the opposite, uh, the opposite fear, such as what if the Bible is wrong and if I follow it, uh, it will actually block me from life? That's, that's uh, block me from life. Oh, that's an interesting thing to think about. Well, that's uh, one of my that's one of my key arguments mm. is that i i think that at least the streams of christianity i grew up in um are very 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 focused on eternity at the expense of the present and i actually from studying buddhism and taoism i've found like a tremendous value in 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 appreciating the present and emphasizing the present um and i think christians sometimes suck at that <laughs> Let's see. Not always, though. Pulling something up real quick. Okay, and also Wolf Waffle Apocalypse for the five dollars says, "Great stream, y'all. Uh, this is my first time watching you and the stream, and I had fun." Well, hell yeah! And also, I'm gonna grab this. Hold on a minute. There were a couple of people who said this was their first time in the stream, uh, especially live, and they really enjoyed being in the chat. Hell yeah! Cool. Um, when you say hell yeah, you mean H E L yeah? H E L. Right? Yes. That's it. Uh, the goddess. Uh, the goddess. I've been doing a hell. little, a little study. So okay, so the, as far as the calcifer thing, I brought, I got this shirt made, uh, which my roommate Tipsy 
Get it's that done. a little bit closer to the camera. Yeah, hold on a second. Let me just actually, I'll make it full screen here. I'm going to take over. Yeah, do it. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Wait a minute. Actually, I don't think I have a full screen on this one. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, wait, here we go. There we go. Got it. All right. So this is the shirt. It's Calcifer sitting at a chair and reading a bunch of what seems like necromancy texts. Uh, but you can get necromancy? that. Necromancy? Ne- yeah, it is actually on the store. It is called the Necromancer. Yeah. Um, so I'll get the link to that in the uh, uh, the chat here in a second. Um, it's in the description of the video as well, I believe. Um, here we go. Ah. Yeah, I'll grab it. You you show off other merch. No, I got it. No, that's, I mean, <laughs> I don't have any, any more merch, like, actually within easy reach. I don't think about it so much, and I don't, I also show feel up. weird about pushing it. So, Do you have any of your other shirts nearby? No, that's it. That's what I was oh, going to say. It's like, that's, the, that's the new one, which is the Calcifer shirt. Um, you should chill your own shit, man. But I should, <laughs> but I don't. <laughs> but anyway, with that, thank you guys for coming out. Uh, and thank you, John, for coming on. This thank was you awesome so much having for having you. me. It this was an really absolute awesome. pleasure. Yeah, this is an awesome conversation. And yeah, we should definitely do this again, man. Absolutely. Uh, and with that, uh, be sure to find a way or make one. Go big or go home. And stay I, curious. <laughs> I guess. Are we doing <laughs> sign off lines? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And now I know where the stream ending button is. It's over here. Bye.